So, okay. Uh, members, is anybody aware of any apologies? And has any notice been given from any members, delegated authority to another member of the committee to vote under temporary standing order 1156? Hi, Philip. How are you? Good. There is no. Nope. No. Uh, moving on to the next item of the agenda, declaration of interest. I have an interest in agenda item 18.33 which is to do with the constituent, and I will raise that issue. Uh, we have we've had similar sort of issues of this as we've gone through before, but I'll ask uh, for any issues to do that. I'll ask the uh, deputy chair to take the, the chair at that point. Any other uh, declarations of interest? Yeah, thank you. Chair, sorry. Um, I have a declaration for um, a minute. Sorry, Gemma, can um, you say that again? I didn't hear it. Declaration of interest for agenda item number eight, the building regulations, the um, energy buildings and energy performance building regulations. Okay. Thank you. Fully recorded. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda nine number three, uh, chairperson's business. Um, first things I would like to say is, I've, indeed, um, within this committee, uh, and for quite a few of us, obviously the. Uh, Untimely death of His Royal Highness uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, I think, is a moment of sadness, and it's indeed a moment of sadness and national reflection of where, of where we're from. I would like to, as the chair of this committee, but also uh, speaking as an MLA, to say how pleased I was with the respectful comments and uh, uh, messages of condolence made on the passing of His Royal Highness. And I just wanted to reflect that within this committee and uh, pass that pass that message on. Thank you. Uh, the next item on agenda is I had an informal meeting uh, with the Fiscal Commission. Uh, as previously agreed by the committee, I met informally with the chairperson of the Fiscal Commission on the 30th of March 2021. I encouraged the Commission to engage with local political and business representatives. It is anticipated that the Commission may engage formally with the committee in a few months' time and that the Commission's, Commission's report will be produced in February 2020. Are members content to note? February 22. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, 2022. What did I say? 2020. Oh, did I? Sorry, apologies. It's been a long day already. Yeah. Okay. Are we agreed? Agreed. Right. Um, and for, next uh, item on the agenda, informal meeting of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. The committee previously agreed that it was content for me to meet with the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and other Assembly Statutory Committee chairpersons tomorrow inspect the protocol. Uh, are members content for the Deputy Chairperson to attend in my place, Darry permitting? You are not available, are you, Paul? No, I have just said to Peter there today I will not be able to attend. Okay. I, I, I think we would be content for uh, Peter the Clerk to sit in and pass any sort of relevant information that comes from that, because it will be with all the, sort of the committee chairs, if we are content. Yep. Great. Uh, next item is uh, the depart departure of the Departmental Permanent Secretary. Um, according to recent press reports, the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Finance is to move to the new Permanent Secretary role in the Cabinet uh, Office. It is understood that the role will be filled temporarily before an external competition is held. Uh, is the Committee content to write to the Department giving our best wishes to Sue and seeking clarity on the timeline for her departure and her replacement? Great. Uh, yes, and also uh, I think there is a question we need to understand who is the Chief Operating Officer of the Department of Finance at the moment, because that has some significant that does have some significant implications in the rest of it. Do you believe Ms. Gray is still in office or not? Well, we don't know, Chairperson. I, uh, sorry, Chair, I read this uh, as he did on, yeah. uh, on the BBC, so I'm, I'm not actually aware. She's still of in that. office. Um, Matter on Tuesday. Yeah. Right. What I would like to say is. I think um, Sue coming to the Department of Finance and coming to Northern Ireland has been a breath of fresh air uh, as we're trying to sort of struggle to improve the administration and how we put the necessary reforms that RHI identified that had to be made in place. And I think, uh, speaking on a personal capacity, there is a degree of regret that I have that she is unable to stay because I think uh, we do need really significant change in how a lot of things are done in Northern Ireland, and I think uh, we will miss her. But I do hope in her new role, 
in the, uh, within the Cabinet Office. She will continue to have a close uh, interest in Northern Ireland and all that it does. Okay. Thank you. Uh, draft minutes of proceedings, the 24th of March 21. Draft minutes of the meeting on the 21st of March 2021 are at page 8. Are members content that the draft minutes on the, are an accurate record of proceedings? If we are so to agree, say aye. aye. There are no matters arising. Uh, can I ask, uh, next item on the agenda, Oral Briefing Institute of Government Public Sector Reform. Can I ask Alex to come in and Starley? Hi, Alex. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. Can you hear it? Good. That's good. Okay. Uh, team, this is a briefing on public sector reform. Uh, Alex is the Programme Director for the Institute for Government. The following papers are relevant to this agenda item. The Clark's cover note at page 19. Institute for Government paper at page 24 and the previous Public Sector Reform Division briefing paper at page 29. Alex, would you care to make an opening statement? Please, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much and uh, thank you for uh, having me. I was going to keep this uh, fairly uh, brief really and just uh, run through some of the points that I made in, uh, in evidence and then I'm looking forward to answering your um, questions. Um, uh, uh, I'm just going to minimise myself so I'm not staring at myself for the next uh, <laughs> period. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, to introduce myself, I'm uh, Alex Thomas, as you said. I uh, have been for the last uh, sort of 14, 15 months the programme director at the Institute for Government uh, uh, leading on the civil service and uh, policy making. Um, before that, I was a senior civil servant. I worked in uh, DEFRA, Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, as uh, a director of uh, animal and plant health and also helping coordinate some of the no deal Brexit planning. Um, I was uh, principal private secretary before that to uh, Jeremy Hayward, who was cabinet secretary and head of the civil service. And before that, I worked on various constitutional and uh, other matters in the cabinet office, also with Jeremy Hunt uh, in the Department of Health uh, and uh, then way back when uh, in, in DEFRA on other matters as well. So most of my experience is as a, a practicing civil servant, but I've been thinking for the last uh, year and a bit about the civil service and particularly the GB civil service, um, I should say, uh, and civil service reform since I joined the Institute for um, Government. So my main, uh, my main sort of theme in, in terms of this opening statement really uh, is to emphasize the point I made in the evidence about the um, similarity of uh, the themes and points of uh, civil service and public sector reform going all the way back sort of to the um, end of the Second World War really. Um, I, I picked out the Fulton report uh, in 1968 that um, uh, suggested there were too many generalists in the civil service, um, not enough trained managers, uh, and uh, not enough uh, contact um, with uh, the real world, if I can put it that uh, way. Um, the Next Steps program uh, in the 1980s that talked about not enough uh, implementation and delivery experience, not enough specialisms, not enough commercial nous in the civil service. Uh, then through the, uh, the, the 1997 to 2010 uh, Labour government where um, the focus was on uh, more um, competition in the, in the civil service but also a focus Focus on uh, outcomes and uh, public service agreements that drew different parts of government uh, together um, uh, and uh, to uh, program management and project management in particular. Um, uh, then we move into the, the, the Maud era uh, in 2010 uh, onwards, as, uh, uh, as, as it's sort of uh, uh, colloquially referred to, um, where there was a focus on lots of the same things, more corporate leadership. And the thing, the thing particularly to draw out, I think, from the 2010 uh, and onwards reforms, which I think is relevant to some of the uh, public service and civil service challenges that, that the Northern Ireland civil service is grappling with, is this uh, establishment of professions and functions in the civil service to complement the uh, policy generalists as they've been uh, known as. So um, uh, I, I think that has made a real and material difference to uh, civil, to, to, the, to the performance of uh, the civil service. And I think it's given a kind of a locus uh, for um, new skills to develop, whether it's commercial or digital and data skills, or finance skills, um, or uh, many others. Um, uh, and I think it's provided a bit more professional accountability for uh, those in the GB UK civil service um, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, um, uh, to, to, to assess their performance. It's not without its tensions, though, and one of the, uh, again, themes that may come up in some of our um, discussions 
uh, is the um, uh, is is the uh, vertical departmental tension and the horizontal um, profession tension um, uh, tension with the, the horizontal professions. So, and I think this is a problem that the GB civil service hasn't really cracked. Uh, because it's tried to have it both ways, a sort of control of the uh, and, and professionalization of the civil service led by the cabinet office and reaching across all departments. So you have a consistent uh, and coherent uh, procurement approach, commercial approach, digital approach, and so on. But the center of gravity in the UK GB civil service is departmental and so permanent secretaries who perfectly reasonably feel they are accountable for the money that's spent by departments, they're accountable to the public accounts committee uh, in parliament and to their secretary of state. Uh, and this is a tension I think that the, uh, the civil service hasn't um, really resolved. So although things have got, um, you know, have improved and got better on uh, uh, that functions and professions uh, side, there's a, um, uh, there's a, uh, a, 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 um, a, a an unresolved tension there, I think, um, and it's not clear whether the GB civil service is going to um, push much more strongly to central control or to keep that departmental um, uh, 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 locus. I suspect uh, ministers will be will be in favour of the uh, of the the former. Um, <clears throat> Then uh, uh, next, I was just going to run through very quickly what, what I see and, and, and uh, talking to colleagues at the Institute for Government as well as some of the priorities for, uh, again, I emphasize GB civil service reform, but I think they apply um, uh, more generally. Um, uh, one is improving the skills of civil servants. And I think one of the striking things is about data in the civil service and just how uh, poorly understood, understood the civil service itself knows about the skills that it that it has and that its people have. It's very easy to say that we need more we need more um, digital people, we need more project managers, um, we need more scientists, or uh, you know, dare I say it, misfits and, and, and weirdos in the in the civil service. Um, but uh, that overlooks the fact the civil service already has an awful lot of scientists, data specialists, project managers. It just often doesn't know where they are and can't um, uh, uh, and can't um, divert them to, to to where they would be most um, useful. The second uh, priority, I think, is 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 uh, stating the obvious to some extent, which is responding to technological change, uh, understanding and ad adapting to it. Um, uh, uh, that's going to change all of our um, uh, workplaces and uh, all of our lives in in different ways. I think the uh, core essence of what government and what the civil service has to do, policy making, advice to ministers, implementation, uh, will stay the same. But I think the context in which that happens will be different, and so um, uh, it will be really important to um, uh, to, uh, uh, to for the civil service to be able to respond and to have a base that ev almost everybody in the civil service has a base level of technological and uh, digital uh, skills and then uh, others are much more specialist. Um, uh, thirdly, entrenching and building uh, on the functions and uh, professions uh, model. I talked about that a moment ago, so I won't uh, I won't um, uh, labour that, but I think there is an opportunity for the civil service to do more to create teams to advise ministers, but also to implement policy decisions uh, that more explicitly re uh, recognize those different professions into, I call it multidisciplinary teams there, you might like that jargon or not, but um, uh, <clears throat> but to, uh, rather than uh, sort of a happenstance of how teams happen to sort of fall together and then drawing in uh, uh, new skills over time to much more actively manage and, and direct the uh, the different skills of those teams. Um, controversial subject today, um, but um, the porosity or permeability of uh, the civil service and um, uh, the wider business community, despite some of the uh, controversies about lobbying that um, uh, uh, are in the news at the moment and regularly surface, I do think there is a real value to um, uh, move, a movement between the private sector, the wider public sector and the civil service, because uh, th th those um, uh, different groups have the skills that um, uh, that the civil service needs. I think there are you know, a number of examples, but the one that comes most readily to mind um, is the uh, UK government response to the collapse of Carillion, where um, in that case, commercial um, skills were really important in allowing the government to respond more effectively than it, than it would have done without that um, commercial experience. Um, and then uh, the, the, the final sort of priority is about rewarding people who take responsibility. I think there's something um, about the the, you know, the civil service will always need people who move around rapidly, 
who um, uh, can uh, uh, be sort of ministerial courtiers, if you like, who can make things happen for ministers, who can smooth things over when they go wrong. Um, but I think there is a tendency, and I speak perhaps to someone who was you know, one of those a bit myself when I was a civil servant, to over reward and recognize and promote those people and to under reward the people who, um, uh, who stick with a project and get the thing done. Uh, they're, they're not necessarily sort of at the coalface or the most prominent people at the time, but they are the people who, um, who have been set an objective, um, stick around and, uh, and, and deliver it. And I think drawing all those things together, the, the, the civil service uh, in, the, in GB should um, uh, uh, be uh, more active in, in thinking about those things and, and developing a strategy for its medium uh, and long-term development, which points to my final point, I think, in this, in, in this statement, which is uh, that I think your uh, discussions, your reflection is very timely uh, on this subject. Obviously, you're um, uh, uh, looking at a particular context in Northern Ireland with the um, uh, response and follow up to the uh, RHI inquiry and to particular context there. Um, one of the things that I think GB Civil Service has done too little of is to really seriously think this is our strategy for the civil service, this is our strategy for the skills that we want, and this is how we're going to get there. So um, uh, in my experience, that, those sorts of moments tend to happen when there is a, uh, a kind of critical mass of uh, consensus and a bit of a crisis uh, that says we really need to do something to address these um, problems. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a, an opportunity. So, so uh, all power to your committee and to the Northern Ireland Civil Service for um, uh, for, for pursuing this, um, this agenda. And that was really what I was going to say by, by way of um, introduction. I hope that's useful. Okay. Uh, thanks very much indeed. Uh, so, Alex, what you're describing is sort of at the macro level, but we in Northern Ireland are dealing with this sort of in a microcosm sort of level. And the issue with the Northern Ireland Civil Service is does it have the su sufficient skills and does it have the culture to realise it needs to change? Because what you've described is sort of how the stovepiping happens, how departments are stovepiped. The fact in Northern Ireland we have an absolute plethora of arm's length bodies who realise that change needs to happen and they're doing change. But there doesn't seem to be an overall coordinating pattern or push to change the culture that realise that change is indeed needed. And you know, for instance, we don't have fast drink, um, which I was quite surprised about because in one of my previous roles when the Minister of Defence, I always used to, you know, fast stream. I was always given four or five fast streamers every year when they came in to look after them and develop them and do that sort of process. And here in Northern Ireland, we don't even have sort of that degree of fast streamers and that ability to have that sort of even that degree of understanding of excellence to try and to grow that and develop. So, how, what lessons can we identify? Because we've got to change. We can't keep on doing the way we things are at the moment. I mean, we're in this rather strange situation where we can't appoint a, a, a new head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. So by the understandings of the media, I understand we're going to appoint two, which is only, only in Northern Ireland could we get to a situation where you know, the answer to the problem is double it. Um, but those, that points to me something as a structurally as a cultural problem. What sort of guidance from the Institute of Government should you, you know, could you give us to say about you know, how do we get that cultural change uh, moving. And I know, I think, speaking as a politician who is sometimes being quite exasperated by this, the rate of change and the fact that we need to change, but how do we do it in a way that sort of empowers the civil service to make those decisions itself? And the other question I want to know is, uh, there is so very little cross-pollination. And apart from, uh, we're just saying goodbye to uh, Sue Gray, who was, uh, has been an outstanding public servant, but we've lost her. You know, we couldn't retain her. She's gone back to there. You know, how can we make Northern Ireland's civil service attractive, and how can we move people more back and forth? Because this cross-pollination of ideas has got to come from moving across the entirety of the civil service and even outside it and in to come back into it. There just doesn't seem to be that focus. So how do we do that? Uh, yeah, both great questions. I'll do my best to answer them. And I was, I was listening to what you were saying about Sue uh, earlier, and I recognise that as, a, as a, a, an old and long-standing colleague of, of mine as well when I was a civil servant. So, uh, uh, so I mean, it's, it's it's really inspiring actually, if I can say that, to to, to hear the the, the effect she's uh, she's had and the and the um, uh, change that she's 
she's brought. Um, also, on your point about um, uh, two heads of the civil service, that's not a that's not unique to Northern Ireland. Certainly, there have been various times when there's been a head of the civil service and a cabinet secretary, and uh, uh, and and that uh, has um, uh, has benefits, but also can can create tensions. So I think there's there's always something about responding to the, the nature of the of the moment. I'm I'm, I'm sure on 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 that. On your um, <clears throat> On your first question about how you get change, I think it's not. Uh, first thing is, civil service reform is, uh, again, being a little bit flippant, is is boring. You know, it's a slog. It is a uh, it is um, uh, a thousand small and specific decisions. It is not one big decision. So I think uh, the, the the first point that I would make is about persistence, and it is it, it is about how do you change culture? You don't change culture just by uh, sort of. I mean, it's. It's a lead chip and it's sort of exhortation, but it's also by um, setting the context. It's by the individual decisions that are made about how the civil service is organised and the skills that it that it has. So it's a you know it's 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 a long haul. Secondly, I think civil service reform has um, taken effect most you know for whether the decisions were right and wrong, and I think you know many of them have been right, but not all of them. Um, civil service reform in in in, in London and GB has. Uh, worked uh, most effectively when there has been a committed minister who has given it a real push. Now, Francis Maud, in t from 2010 to 2015, didn't always win friends with the civil service. I, don't, I think he'd be the first person to say he, he, he didn't and didn't always want to. Um, and there were th things that he pushed that lots of civil servants might have disagreed with. <clears throat> but it took that ministerial grit in the oyster to, to, to push change. So I do think a programme of reform is likely to be more effective when it has clear ministerial uh, backing. And I wonder, this is, you know, I don't know this, but a sort of a theory, I wonder whether um, some of the particular context in Northern Ireland and periods without ministers and without that government has been an inhibitor to, 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 to reform. Uh, the third thing I think is you do need, stepping out of government, I've actually become more of a, uh, an advocate for a stronger centre, but which I don't mean, um, lots of things done in the center or um, uh, a sort of too much encroachment on the policy responsibilities of individual departments. But the reforms that have been made in uh, uh, GB would not have happened without a strong cabinet office saying, you know, setting a direction and uh, using the leverage that it has to impose some of these changes from the center. And I would observe that those functions uh, that have been most effective mm -hmm. are the ones where there's been more mm -hmm. of a grip and more of a sense of direction from the centre and more authority flowing from the Prime Minister, the Minister for the Cabinet Office, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary, and the Civil Service uh, out to individual um, permanent secretaries. So those are the, the three things. The sort of it's, it's, it, it is a long-term slog, the ministerial point and, and, a, and a strength at the centre. Um, on your cross-pollination uh, point, again, I don't, I don't think that is uh, in any way easy or straightforward. Um, and it's striking that Sue is the exception um, rather than the norm. I'd say whenever I you know, visit Belfast or uh, Northern Ireland, I think, goodness, why didn't I spend more of my career here? This is a, 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 a very uh, you know, beautiful and good place to, to live. Um, but I think that's a, that's a, 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 um, a, there's something about interchange and about making it as easy as possible for civil servants to spend a portion of their career um, uh, breaking down some of the barriers without you know, removing the independence and the separateness of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. But uh, as Lord Dunlop recommended in his um, recent report, breaking down some of the barriers that exist, um, allowing civil servants to do six month, 12 month, 18 month secondments um, uh, else. Uh, elsewhere, not just in Northern Ireland, but, um, uh, but but outside that, supporting civil servants to uh, move financially so that they can rent somewhere or they can travel back and forth between uh, London or wherever and uh, and Belfast. It's quite kind of practical things. And then it's about um, demonstrating how that knowledge and that experience is good for an individual civil servant's career. So the fact, you know, again, I must not keep coming back to Sue, but the fact that Sue has, uh, you know, is going back uh, to a second permanent secretary job in London from a period in Northern Ireland is likely to make other people then look at that and think, well, there's an interesting career route there. And the more people to do that, the more self-fulfilling it, it, it should be, I think. Yeah. Actually, just a final question. Look, um, my experience in Whitehall and having spent a lot, there is an awful lot of very good senior Northern Ireland civil servants spread across FCO, Treasury in particular, MOD, um, Home Office, all sorts of different... There seems to be, there is a large number of 
well, and it seems to be sort of well above what you would expect for the degree of population of Northern Ireland. There's an awful lot of very senior sort of Northern Ireland civil servants spread across the whole of the, the civil service. But there doesn't seem to be this mechanism for they wanting to come back or the attractiveness and the rest of it. But I also note, and maybe you can make some comment, just a short comment, please, on some of the issues within Scotland now, because there used to be a, a big throughput between the Scottish government and the Scottish civil service and the roles from there. But that seems to have become more segmented as well. And I just wonder, is the influence, you know, is there too much influence in sort of politics in some respects? In sort of um, across the civil service, uh, that means that we must get to a stage now where, in some respects, we need to sort of depoliticise some some parts of the civil service and what we're trying to do. I mean, very you know, from from speaking from somebody who's very closely connected to, uh, to to Scotland as well, seeing what's happened quite recently and how that sort of that breakdown and that sort of breakdown in trust seems to have happened as well. Can we can we? Uh, address, how could we address some of those issues? I don't think there is a, uh, as is often sort of said, a, you know, a politicisation of the civil service. I think the civil service and the best civil servants have always been politically aware but in, impartial. And I haven't noticed a significant change on that. But I do think you're right to pick up on the Scotland point. It's become less natural to sort of cycle a, a, around. I think, and I think that's a perception point. Um, it's it's a uh, and, and I think it's mostly wrong. When I talk to civil servants who uh, work for the Scottish government, uh, you know, almost entirely, they have exactly the same values, exactly the same sort of uh, attitude to their ministers, if I put it that way, as as, as anyone in the uh, rest of the civil service. But there is a perception that when your um, ministers are so far apart and are questioning the entire basis of the kind of country that you're working for. That that puts um, puts additional barriers uh, up. Um, I think that's, but I think that's a kind of, I think that's a false perception, and I think uh, it requires leadership from the, at the ministerial level on both sides to say we really want this to happen, and we recognise the value that it will bring. So I think the first step is ministers to to, to sort of unequivocally say this is a good thing, um, and then uh, it's uh, uh, it's about um, presenting. Uh, that to civil servants and, and the same points that I made a moment ago about helping people relocate, demonstrating why it's good for their um, careers. But I think there is a sort of leadership point in that as well. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Thanks. Jim? Yeah, um, I don't know how much of the RHI report you read, but if you familiarised yourself with it, you will be aware of the probably one of the most primary and damning findings that the RHI scheme was beyond the capacity of the Northern Ireland Civil Service to operate. That is quite a damning finding. So how do we fix something as basic as that? I um, can't claim to have read every page of the RHI inquiry, but I've read the conclusions and the recommendations, and I was familiar with that um, that, that aspect. Uh, um, you're right, it is a, 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 a damning uh, uh, criticism, um, and the um, nature of a scheme like that shouldn't be beyond a, a civil service of whatever size to, to operate. I, but I don't, think, I don't think there is a, a, a sort of single answer that you can say, this is what the, the, the thing that will improve the capability of the civil service. I think um, it, it's about attracting talented people to uh, uh, join the civil service. I think it's about properly performance managing the people who are there so that if they're not able to do the job, they are um, supported to do it better, or if they can't do it, moved on to a, a different job or moved out. Um, uh, I think it's uh, about recognizing the individual skills as I said, the sort of multidisciplinary team thing, uh, so that the individual skills that you need to do a, to to make a complex project like that effective, and I think, and this is another thing that that came out from the uh, inquiry's conclusions, as I understand it, um, you need civil service to stay in place, uh, and not to say they should never move, but you need them to stay in place for long enough to uh, understand and be able to. Um, make the thing happen that they've been charged with with uh, implementing, uh, and then alongside their ministers to be held accountable for for whether it got um, uh, whether, whether it worked or not. 
so it's, it's sort of, and no doubt there are another 20 things I could reel off, but I, um, I, I won't, but it's a, it's a, it's a combination of those well, sorts of... Well, could I ask you about one other thing? Mm. One of the other, for me, alarming uh, matters which emerged very strongly at the RHI inquiry was the culture within it right at the top of a lack of independence, illustrated by the fact that the gentleman who went on to become the head of the civil service gave evidence to the effect that minutes were not kept of meetings because ministers didn't want any written record. Now, that culture of deference, we call it as neutral and as kind a word as we can, is of course totally at variance with the very idea of a transparent, independent civil service. So if that is something which permeates right to the top, how do you address that? I think it's, um, I think it's an important point. I would pick you up on one specific thing there, which is I don't think the civil service should be independent. I think the civil service needs to be impartial, and I think it needs to be able to serve governments of any and whatever political type, but I don't think it should be independent from government. I mentioned that just because I think it's it's a mm. okay. it may be a linguistic thing, but it's 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 something that you can get the wrong impression that there's this sort of separate source of legitimacy in the civil service that exists. And I and I, I don't think that's the case. I think the civil service can only derive its legitimacy from a democratically elected um, government. But your your main point I recognize and I think it's sort of the it's the ca it's the opposite of the um, yes minister caricature of um, trying to be an obstacle to ministers. I think, and this is in the GB civil service as well. One of the um, uh, main uh, difficulties that the civil service has is in its ability to say no to minister and to speak truth to power and to stand up to ministers. I think the uh, senior civil servants can often, um, for understandable reasons, be so eager to. Um, uh, to win the confidence of ministers, particularly new ministers, that they find it quite difficult to um, uh, to say no in a you know but in a constructive way. And I think I don't think there's an uh, uh, answer to that beyond really strong civil service leadership and equipping civil servants with the skills to do a to um, to sort of say no, but or you it, it can't be done this way. But if this is the objective that you want to achieve. You've hit a way that is uh, that will work that is that is appropriate. So it's about understanding what a minister's objectives are and then turning that into something that that will work rather than rather than won't. But I think a sort of uh, a culture of um, deference or fear is uh, counterproductive and, and and not 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 uh, doesn't make for good government. Coming out of RHI, we're told there's a subcommittee on the RHI inquiry. We also have the public sector reform division. In preparing for today, did you find any encouraging crossover between those two? I couldn't give you a detail on those two in particular. I must confess I haven't come across uh, that. But I did find, I mean, I looked at the National Audit Office for Northern Ireland um, report, um, and I've uh, uh, looked at some of the other documents that, that the civil service and the government have produced around that. And I would sort of, uh, a cautious encouragement, oh, I took a cautious encouragement that, that those sorts of issues were being taken seriously. What I think it's too early to tell is um, whether the, they will stick. And of course, it goes back to my long slog point at the beginning, which is um, that uh, it is not enough just to say these things or to produce reports. You have to set up the architecture to talk to each other. But I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't come back on your very specific point uh, with apologies. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Paul? Yes, thank you. And uh, found, I found this presentation very interesting. So thank you for your, your paper and your, your time here today. It strikes me that there is a real issue here, and it might be down to size and scale, but there seems to be a real issue here about expertise in the right places, as you've already outlined and said. Now, don't get me wrong, there are many great, brilliant minds in our civil, servants, civil service. It doesn't necessarily mean, though, they're in the right locations. 
And there are big, powerful interests out there in the real world. Uh, let me give you one example. Energy. If, if there was to be a tweak or change in the executive or ministerial positions in this country, I would argue that there might well be a case for a minister for energy and climate change. But what we know, having sat through all the inquiry and what I know about energy is that energy branch within the Department of the Economy is very, it's very poor and has always been so. And so when you have a, a specialism inside a department that is involved in a, an area of real life that is vested in interest and very powerful players within it, <coughs> how have other jurisdictions, even other devolved jurisdictions in the UK, overcome that massive issue where you nearly have a David and Goliath situation? where David is a civil servant um, and he's trying or she's trying to gain expertise and receive information that is true, tried and tested, but may well have to lean on these interest groups to actually develop that skill set. And that then could be a flawed science. Uh, that's a real, that is a real danger and a real problem here in Northern Ireland in that one sphere. Now I'm talking about energy, but you could you could list a number of issues where that would happen. Welfare, you know, health, you could go on. Is that a problem in our devolved areas and how do they overcome it? I think there are, it's a, it's a really interesting point, I uh, agree. And I think um, there are a lot of, um, you know, there are a lot of different points wrapped up in that. One is that, um, you know, it, it is the, it is a core job of the a civil servant um, to be able to synthesize, <clears throat> particularly a civil servant working on policy, to be able to synthesize all sorts of different interests coming into that civil servant and to be able to weigh them off and to to apply their own judgment to that. So I think that's just a that that is just a, a core skill. That's the sort of the essence of what the civil service is, and that's for civil service managers, civil service leaders to create that. Um, culture. Um, yes, it's, you know, I, I, I can see it could be tempting sometimes to rely or over rely on some particular lobbyists in some particular areas. But that to me is that's a civil servant just not not doing their job in the right way. They need to synthesize and they need to reach their own conclusion and work out what they agree with and what they um, don't agree with. The second um, point, I think, uh, to your uh, David and Goliath point, we saw that in the um, some of the commercial parts of uh, the uh, GB civil service, um, where you had people agreeing uh, contracts uh, or running procurement processes um, up against you know, vastly more sophisticated uh, and vastly uh, more kind of well-powered and well-funded um, uh, uh, businesses. Uh, and the way you address that is by strengthening your, in that case, procurement and commercial uh, function. So you bring in the people who have expertise, you take a more sophisticated approach to um, procurement and contract management. You just need to spend the money and, and uh, on, on the people and get and, and, and get the people in. That's not easy. Uh, again, there's none of this is, but but you need to, um, uh, to to ensure that you're getting the people who have the right judgment and and have the confidence and 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 so on to 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 stand up to them. I think the third point is about um, uh, uh, is about that authority flowing from ministers and from the top of the civil service. So that civil servants feel, to use that sort of slightly dreadful word, empowered to, um, to, to stand up to these people and know that they will be backed and they won't be undermined if, uh, uh the person they're, uh, st standing off against goes over their head, either politically or, um, uh, or, or, or to the civil service. So they'll be backed. And then the final, uh, point on that, I think is about valuing, that expertise, there is a tendency in the GB civil service, and I suspect in Northern Ireland as well, um, to uh, not not have really uh, uh, good career paths for those who have expertise. And so you get the genuine expert in a policy area slightly languishing in a team um, uh, without uh, a sense of career progression, and so becoming disillusioned, and so um, uh, uh, and, and so uh, not performing as well as they. Uh, might and not having the status that they might. So I think 
giving, I mean, the Treasury, for example, tried some interesting, uh, this going back sort of over the course of the last 10 years or so, um, giving expert specialists career paths where they didn't have to inc ever increase their management span. They didn't have to climb the greasy pole in the way that most policy civil servants did. They had opportunities to progress in their career while retaining their policy specialism. It's a bit like allowing teachers to carry on teaching, I suppose, rather than moving up into, into management. So I think, I think that, you know, having that sort of career progression um, helps to um, uh, uh, helps to uh, also helps to bolster the status of those civil servants and gives them a bit more kind of armour against uh, uh, against the, the lobbying and the influence that you that you set out. But part of your answer there described what we would call co-design. In that, or if we have a, a limited scale and size of a civil servant or a branch of civil service, then we we contract and if you like uh, co-design, uh, bring people in with expertise. Ha has that worked? In your uh, in your mind, has that worked in other areas? Yes, I think it has. I think, but I think in my experience, it's it's patchy. So where senior civil servants, uh, it's it, it's a good thing to do. Uh, you obviously need to apply it to different contexts and do it slightly differently in different ways, and there'll be different sensitivities associated with different policy areas. But <clears throat> it's some. Um, uh, it, it is in principle, and uh, we as the IFG would say in principle, it is a good thing to do. It's a good way to make policy. Um, I think uh, in GB civil service, it's um, patchy. And I think there are there's a relatively small kind of cohort of civil servants who really get this and do apply co-design principles and really engaging with the public and so on. Um, uh, uh, and there are quite a lot of other civil servants and ministers who don't and do the sort of consulting by rote type approach that more traditional policy making might, um, uh, might, have, might have done. Um, so I think it's a good thing, but I don't think it's systematically applied enough across any of our civil services. We're constantly told that civil service advise and ministers decide. What does, what does a healthy relationship look like in your eyes? You know, how, how robust should civil service advise uh, and, and, and when, when should, and I, I suppose I'm going in the realms of politics with you, but then with regards to a minister, a decider, how, how, how much do they then, should they then put trust into their team, their civil service around them? Obviously, in my time in politics, I've seen weaknesses there right across the scale. Where, where, where do, what does, what does it look like? What does a utopia look like in this d democratic world? Oh, there's, a, there's an opportunity. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, I think the, um, I think the uh, ideal situation is where ministers and the government as a whole sets a really clear sense of direction. Civil servants work best when they know what direction they're supposed to be going in. Um, so, the initial, uh, uh, the initial. Uh, sort of arrow comes from uh, the minister. So this is where we want to go. This is what we want to achieve. The civil servant then takes that away. Says, "I know where my minister wants this to end up. I'm going to come up with a series of options. I'm going to honestly, you know, genuinely, without you know, without fear or favour, say this is what I think. Will work. This is what I don't think will work. This is what you know. And you, and you set that out uh, in a way that doesn't sort of uh, uh, artificially constrain options or different approaches by doing particular, uh, you know, ridiculous option A and ridiculous option C, so you definitely go for B. It's a genuine uh, sort of reflection, and then a, that turns into a, a discussion with a minister about what you might do. You then have a bit of argy-bargy and a bit of disagreement, and the civil service says, well, surely, you know, this is what, this is, this is the best way to do it, and the minister, because they've uh, got a different perspective uh, and know that they'll be held accountable to the public for it um, says um, uh, says uh, uh, says no actually you know we're going to do it I, I'm going to take 70% of your advice but I'm going to uh, disagree with the other 30% and then um, and then the civil service says fine thank you, we, you know, we've, we've had our we've had our say I, I think it it goes wrong if if the civil service can't express itself or an, a civil servant can't express themselves um, but then and the culture is pretty strong in my experience that once a minister has decided, and there's been a you know a collective decision or, or or whatever the appropriate mechanism is. Civil service then says, right, we're going to get on and do this, um, uh, and that 
and that's a that's a healthy relationship where you're being honest with each other all the way through but the civil service is rightly subservient to the democratic um uh mandate that a that a, that a minister has does that oh, does that answer the question yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I'm, very, I'm sorry for throwing that at you but uh, it's a very broad uh question needing a very broad answer but thank you very much for your time thank you chair okay thanks very much indeed uh, matthew thank you chair and thanks um, alex for your evidence um so i arrived a little late so um, i missed some of your apologies for that chair and also missing um some of your earlier evidence, Alex. I, I just wanted to ask, and apologies if I'm repeating uh, evidence you've already given, but um, what are your impressions of the Northern Ireland Civil Service? That's a great question. Um, uh, <laughs> I, so I work mostly with the Northern Ireland Civil Service in DEFRA in various guises um, with your uh, excellent Chief Veterinary Officer um, and uh, other related teams. Um, and then uh, occasionally had some sort of dealings with it in the in the in the cabinet office and uh, uh, through the cabinet secretary's office. Um, I think it's uh, full of extremely committed people. Uh, I think there's a lot of wisdom there, and I think it, I think actually the GB civil service has quite a lot to learn about some of the continuity of um, posts and on the ground expertise. Uh, I think it is, um, my impression is that it is closer, as you would expect, closer to the citizen and more able to uh, um, apply a more sort of tangible uh, uh, lens to policy problems. Um, but I think it is, uh, in terms of its flexibility and uh, some of those sort of professional, functional um, uh, 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 aspects that I was talking about earlier, um, some way behind the UK uh, civil service. I think the, the flip side of the strength of continuity and expertise is perhaps a little bit of, um, uh, I'm not thinking, genuinely not thinking about individuals here, but a little bit of uh, more sort of, uh, of a slotic approach and a sort of slower response to changing circumstances. Um, and I think it, um, given the complexity of some of the issues it's dealing with, it, it felt to me un under-resourced and you had a relatively small number of people trying to span a very uh, broad um, area. Um, so uh, uh, I, th I think, uh, you know, huge strengths to build on, but an opportunity to be more dynamic and to be more uh, sort of thoughtful and forward thinking about the skills that it really needed. And I, I, I do wonder, again, I think it's why some of your reflections and your, your, your work and, uh, uh, and the civil service itself work is timely in that I think some of the changes that are um, likely to happen uh, around technology and uh, the way policy is made, um, uh, the Northern Ireland Civil Service is, is perhaps less likely to be uh, equipped to respond to those. Um, so yeah, again, hope, hope, hope that answers the question. One of the, one of the findings or recommendations in the IFG report, um, or in, in, in IFG recommendations in relation to the uh, civil service in Britain is around improving porosity um, between um, wider public and private sector. Do, would you, do you have any findings or comments on the level of porosity in the Northern Ireland civil service? I don't, uh, I'm not close enough to, to, to particularly know, but I would say that I think the GB civil service has done quite a lot on that in the last 10 years or so. And I don't think the Northern Ireland civil service has done the same. So perhaps on that score, the Northern Ireland civil service is you know, where the UK civil service was 10 or um, 15 years ago. My impression is that there is uh, less um, uh, uh, sharing of expertise uh, between different sectors uh, in Northern Ireland than um, than in GB. Um, uh, that can bring its own challenges as we're seeing at the moment. But um, uh, but I would I would say it was it was lower in Northern Ireland. Um, do you think there? Do you think you think it's lower? Okay. Would you say how much? What is the? You answered my question before about your perception of the Northern Ireland Civil Service how wide a an understanding in uh, Whitehall is there of, of how the Northern Ireland civil service works? I don't so much mean the sort of societal specifics or 
the, our institutions are power sharing or anything like that. I mean, the, how, the fact that, for example, it's a an institution. It's a separate. It's a separate civil service. Is that known? Are people aware of that? Yes. So I think I think the, the essentials are known, and the constitutional position is known. Um, I think the uh, sort of nature of the issues that the Northern Ireland Civil Service deals with is known. So it was very widely discussed, for example, uh, when uh, the uh, assembly uh, was um, suspended and when the civil service was operating uh, without ministerial oversight. I think that that level is known. I think the uh, sort of interchange, and this goes back to some of the um, points that Dr. Uh, Aiken was saying at the, at the start, the level of interchange is, is, is not high. And I th think before Brexit, the, uh, and particularly the, no, the planning for no deal Brexit, in my personal experience, um, the actual day-to-day -day working with North civil servants in the Northern Ireland Civil Service was relatively low and confined to particular parts of government, for example, DEFRA, where there was quite a lot of day-to-day uh, uh, -day contact between, um, uh, uh, between civil servants, but generally much lower. But I think one of the uh, sort of uh, unexpected consequences of uh, Brexit and no deal planning was quite a lot of closer working across many different departments with the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Okay. One of the one of the things that's distinctive here and a bit of an issue is that and it sort of goes back to what you were talking about around porosity is that um, there is a much higher age profile. Our civil servants tend to have a much higher age profile. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that per se or having, but um, do you think that would have any impact on the? Uh, the ability of a civil service to adapt to technological change or change generally. Secondly, a, a related point is on um, Northern Ireland not having a fast stream for several years. There was an intention uh, to restart the fast stream. I don't know Sue Gray, who, as you know, is now going back to Whitehall, um, was planning to restart the fast stream, but we're not sure that's happening. Do you think those two points would be useful to get your views on. One, are higher than, like, significantly higher age profile in terms of our civil service. And secondly, the lack of a fast stream. Would either of those things concern you? Uh, yes. Um, I think, uh, I mean, on the second of those, fast stream, uh, I think, yes, it's, it, it would be a good thing. The fast stream is, is a useful injection of talent and um, uh, energy into the uh, GB civil service. Um, uh, fast stream is an addition to any uh, civil service team um, uh, I think there are always questions over how quickly they circulate around and you know how they can pick up skills but um, uh, and how you reform the fast stream to make sure you're picking up the skills that the civil service will need in future rather than uh, the, just the sort of classic uh, uh, generalist type skills um, but but in principle absolutely I think uh, the Northern Ireland civil service would benefit from a fast stream on on your age profile I I agree I was looking at the uh, uh, National Audit Office Northern Ireland report that pointed out that um, uh, I think 80% of senior civil servants in Northern Ireland, in the Northern Ireland civil service, were um, over 50. And I checked it, it that, that equivalent figure is 50% of civil servants in GB civil service over 50. So there is quite a quite a um, uh, striking uh, a divergence there. I, um, you know, having uh, a large number of older people in uh, senior positions is not a bad thing. Uh, it brings experience, it brings authority and credibility, but uh, like all institutions, you both need to have a diverse uh, group of people, both in the sort of protected characteristic sense of diversity, uh, ethnicity and, um, uh, and, and uh, different experiences um, and, and different uh, characteristics. Uh, and in a, you know, cognitive and a life, uh, a socioeconomic background uh, sense of um, diversity, that that is more likely to lead to a stronger, more resilient institution. And also, very basically, you need to um, you don't want to face a crisis of um, uh, experience when uh, a large group of older civil servants uh, retire or decide to leave the civil service. So I do think efforts to bring in and to promote talented people who have different perspectives would would benefit uh, the NICS. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Pat? Thanks very much. Um, on that last 
point just that Matthew had brought up, Alex. It's great to bring in people, you said, with a certain set of skills. And um, I, I, I believe that there was change to happen within the Northern Ireland Civil Service. And it was rumoured that there was a top civil servant coming over from Whitehall who was working. I'm not going to mention any names or any departments, but I, I noticed that um, wasn't able uh, to fulfil a, a role here where this ship is running now for about a year, rudderless, without a leader, but was able to go back to Whitehall and fill a top post in Whitehall. So from your experience um, as the programme uh, director in the Institute for Government, how are you going to get new people to come in here whenever what's gone on in the past sort of goes against that? Yeah, it touches on um, uh, it touches on what we were saying earlier. I think with actually the example of somebody coming to Northern Ireland, doing well and going back to a good job in uh, Whitehall is not a bad one. Uh, I appreciate from uh, that's not my uh, point. The you know, point is that she wasn't able to. Uh, I don't want to mention any specifics, but that said person wasn't able to get a better job here. <laughs> All right. And that's our no, loss. I, so how do you I, work that one out? I, 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 I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with that. My point was going to be that that should encourage people to come to uh, the Northern Ireland Civil oh, Service oh, oh, because oh, it does well. There, so you would. You should attract more people from Northern Ireland, but also from from the rest of the UK to come and do that job. I think the question of whether. Um, I mean, the, the example I suspect you're referring to, the, the waters have run a little deeper on that, and I don't know what's, what, what's happened with it. I, I don't know either. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. The Northern Ireland right Civil now. Service needs to offer you know, good development opportunities to its people, whether they come from elsewhere in the UK or, or from within Northern Ireland. All right. Look, thanks. Good man. Thank you. OK. Uh, Alex, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for your time. And uh, you. I bet you're much happier now than you can be much more forthright now, no longer constrained by the sort of the rules, the rules of office and the rest. But, but thank you very much indeed, and your evidence has been very enlightening and very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Tim, if we move on to the next item on our agenda, it's the oral briefing from Pivotal, again on public sector reform. And Anne, are you available? Hi, Anne. Good to see you again. Good afternoon. Can you hear us okay? Can hear you, yes. Thank you. Excellent. Um, sort of, uh, the clerk's briefing notice is page 49. Pivotal written evidence is at page 54. And could you make an opening statement, please? Thanks. So, by way of introduction, I'm the director of Pivotal, an independent public policy think tank for Northern Ireland. We aim to help improve public policy here by promoting a better use of evidence and involving a wider range of people in talking about the policy issues that matter to them. Pivotal was launched 18 months ago, and so far we've published nine reports. You can find those on our website. Um, we have a new report since I last attended the committee about retaining and regaining talent in Northern Ireland, which looks at the impact of migration of young people for higher education on the Northern Ireland economy. So um, thank you to the committee for the opportunity to provide evidence today. In so doing, I'll be drawing on some of Pivotal's previous reports, for example, our report Good Government in Northern Ireland and New Decade New Approach One Year On. I'll also be using our analysis of the executive's recent priorities and performance and reports produced by others, particularly the Northern Ireland Audit Office, the RHI Inquiry Report and the OECD Public Governance Review. So my evidence is in two sections. First, I'll look at the reasons for public sector reform and how the executive has progressed it overall across a range of public services, for example, in health, education or housing. And then I'll look at the specific issue of civil service reform in the second part of what I say. So at the outset, it's helpful to define, I think, what we mean by public sector reform. So I'm looking at public sector reform to refer to changes to public services that result in them being more effective, efficient and sustainable. So it's about changes in how services are delivered that bring about improved services and improved outcomes, and so greater opportunities and well-being for people in the real world. So public sector reform should be of most benefit to those who rely on public services most, particularly more disadvantaged groups. 
Um, why is public sector reform needed? So public services in Northern Ireland are under serious funding pressures. They're straining to meet needs. Outcomes in some cases are poor. For example, very long health waiting lists, inequalities in education and low levels of skills. Um, and meanwhile, long-term trends like an aging population mean ever increasing demand for services, meaning that, for example, 50% of total Northern Ireland Dale is now taken up by health and social care spending, a percentage that we can only expect to grow over time. So reform is needed to help improve public services and make them sustainable and affordable for the future. And the case for reform is urgent. While there's been some acknowledgement of the need for public sector reform in Northern Ireland, there has been an absence of action. So what public sector reforms have happened in Northern Ireland? So there have been some good examples in recent years. So the, the uh, number of councils was reduced from 26 to 11 in 2015. The government departments were reduced from 12 to 9 in 2016. There were a number of voluntary exit schemes across the public sector starting in 2015. And there's a, a strong record of digitization of public services, making them more accessible for the public and more efficient to run. And I think more recently, we've all got to uh, definitely acknowledge the rapid and significant change in how services are delivered in response to COVID right across the public sector. Um, that's most obvious in health, where there's been quick and radical change in the face of the pandemic, for example, moving GP and hospital consultations to phone or online, setting up COVID testing centres, setting up GP-led COVID assessment centres, and the current much-praised rollout of the vaccination programme. So the public sector has had some reforming in some areas, but there's an urgent need for much more progress. Public sector reform is a, it's a strong theme in strategy and policy documents from the Northern Ireland Executive, particularly in health and social care, for example, the Ben Goa report and other independent reports recently. Um, the Ben Goa report set out four principles for reform in health, um, shifting care out of hospital, more work on prevention and early prevention, support, support for people to live independently and rationalization of acute services. So in the case of health, there does seem to be agreement about what needs to happen in principle, but little progress towards delivering that change. And meanwhile, waiting lists continue to grow, and it's clear that continuing to fund the current system is not sustainable. So progressing reform in health and social care needs to be at the top of the executive's priority list. Just to give a couple of points in housing, to help address the shortage of new homes and the maintenance backlog, a plan was announced late last year to create a mutual housing association out of the landlord arm of the housing executive. Um, and in education, there's a, an acknowledgement that we need to change, not least because of a funding crisis in schools, but there's less agreement about what reforms are needed. So the new independent a new independent review of education provision announced a new decade new approach may help to give greater clarity about what changes are needed in education, although getting political agreement to these will be difficult, I imagine. Um, public sector reform is a very strong theme in new decade new approach. There are eight different references to public sector reform in NDNA and 10 separate references to transforming public services including in housing, health, criminal justice, education, and the civil service. But apart from health and social care, there's a lack of detail in NDNA about what these commitments mean in practice and still less when they might happen. Um, and I would say their status now is uncertain without further confirmation from the executive that they remain a priority. In terms of departmental responsibility for public sector reform, the Department of Finance is the main department. It has a coordinating role through its public sector reform division, which provides advice, gives support and encourages best practice. And um, this includes promoting innovative solutions through the innovation labs. But this is a supporting and enabling role rather than a leadership one. Um, some departments, like the Department of Health and the Department of Education, have their own transformation programs and teams. So what, what assessment would I make of public sector reform in Northern Ireland? So the OECD public governance 
2016, looked at public sector reform here and concluded that there was an absence of a strategic approach with departments taking forward their own reforms without central coordination. Departments remained siloed without a common purpose. And while there was broad agreement about the need for public sector reform, there was limited agreement about what to do and how to do it. Um, having reviewed the OECD report and other recent evidence, I would come to a similar conclusion now. There are many high level commitments to public sector reform like in New Decade, New Approach, but there is limited agreement about what to do in practice or how to do it. There's no central leadership strategy or driving of progress. As a result, there's no action or change in the real world of public service delivery. Taken overall, it is not obvious to me that public sector reform is a high priority for the current executive. Mm. Health and social care is the area where the case, case for reform is most obvious and recent independent reports have set out clearly the changes needed, but progress has been slow. In this area of public sector reform and in others, it would appear there's a reluctance amongst politicians to make the difficult choices and decisions required. So the executive has no overarching strategy for public sector reform. There's no central leadership to drive progress. The Department of Finance provides expert support to departments, but it's not tasked with leading reform across government, and that would seem to be a clear gap. So I'd make the following suggestions about what is needed to bring about effective public sector reform in Northern Ireland. So first of all, really importantly, leadership and ownership from senior politicians and civil servants to drive progress, otherwise change won't happen. There needs to be an overall strategy setting out both headline commitments and details of what that will mean in practice. It needs to be a long-term commitment, which ensures reform remains a priority despite short-term pressures or challenges. There needs to be a willingness to make difficult choices about how and where services are delivered, and some of those might may be unpopular with the public. Uh, there needs to be an ambitious focus on improving outcomes for the people who use public services. And all of that needs to be underpinned by a properly functioning outcomes-based accountability framework with multi-year budgets. And just the final point on that is that stakeholder and staff involvement in any reform is essential, including partnership working with local government, the third sector and businesses. So I'm just going to move on now to talk uh, in slightly less detail or more briefly about civil service reform. Um, so on the specific example of civil service reform as a, a, an aspect of public sector reform, um, two recent reports are relevant, I think. First, obviously, the RHI inquiry report was critical of many aspects of how government works, including the civil service, and made a number of recommendations for changes in systems and practice. And secondly, the recent Northern Ireland Audit Office report, Capacity and Capability in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, gave a critical assessment of the need for change in the NICS workforce. So what progress has there been? So similar to public sector reform overall, there's been some progress on civil service report reform in recent years. Um, there's been the reduction in the number of departments. There's been the voluntary exit scheme, which reduced the overall civil service staff numbers by 3,900 in the four years up to 2019. That's equivalent to 15% of the workforce. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that that reduction in staff numbers has happened at a challenging time for the civil service, including three years without an executive preparing for Brexit and in the past 16 months supporting a new executive and dealing with COVID. So what should be the priorities for the civil service now? Um, again, New Decade, New Approach made a broad commitment to civil service reform, but it's not clear what it meant or what action was taken. Um, I haven't seen any detail provided about that since, although I do know a lot of work has been taken forward within the civil service in response to the RHI inquiry report, for example, uh, a review of risk management, new guidance about project management, new guidance about private office practice and reviews of business case and expenditure approvals. But there's a lack of public information about all of this, greater about progress is needed um, and to that end it would be 
good to see the now very overdue update report from the Executive Subcommittee on RHI implementation. Um, that report was due before Christmas. It will also be helpful to have the audit offices report next month in its role assessing and validating progress on implementing the RHI inquiries recommendations. And of course, in all of this, what is needed is evidence of a change of culture and behaviours, not just box ticking. On the issue of civil service capacity and capability, the recent Northern Ireland Audit Office report published in November 2020 repeated many of the issues highlighted in the RHI inquiry report about a lack of specialist skills and ineffective recruitment practices in the civil service. In addition, um, this NIAO report highlighted an absence of long-term workforce planning and ageing workforce, over-reliance on temporary staff and temporary promotions, and a lack of effective performance management and career development. Um, the report's overall conclusion was stark to, quote, for too long, workforce planning, organisational development and people management have been afforded inadequate priority and direction by the NICS. So just to finish looking ahead, what should be the priorities for civil service reform? Again, I would say there's a clear need for an overall strategy for civil service reform. What does the NDNA commitment to civil service reform mean and what can we expect to happen? Senior leadership from politicians and civil servants will be needed to make any change happen. Um, important elements of a civil service reform strategy, I would suggest should include putting in place specialist capacity so that policy is developed by subject experts where needed, recruitment and allocation of jobs to match people with the appropriate skills to roles, encouraging interchange in and out of the civil service so that staff have a broader range of skills and experience, an outward facing culture that values external expertise and involves a wider range of people in policy making. Um, long term workforce planning to consider whether the current workforce is the appropriate size and with the right skills. Um, increased diversity so the NICS is more representative of the, end of the Northern Ireland population, particularly recruiting more younger staff. I find it shocking to see in the NIAO report that there are only 88 staff in the whole of the NICS aged under 25, um, and 45% of the NICS workforce is aged over 50. Um, and then finally, uh, there needs to be a transformation in performance management so that staff are supported to improve performance and help to develop for the future. Again, in the NIAO report recently, in the whole of the civil service, only 19 staff were judged to have an unsatisfactory performance. Um, so it looks like there needs to be much more effective performance management there. So that concludes my comments. I hope that helpful in looking both at public sector reform overall and then civil service reform as an example. I'm happy to answer any questions from the committee. Um, thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much indeed for your excellent work and your forthrightness. I don't think anything you have said is regrettably a surprise to anybody in this committee anymore. And I think the real concerns we have is the commitment, particularly at the highest level, to be able to institute the reform. And I noticed the PFG, the one that's going through at the moment, doesn't have any sort of sort of headline goals for transformation or change or whatever it happens to be. But to, and bearing in mind, politically speaking, we're in the last year of this mandate anyhow, so the chances of it, anything like that getting on PFG. But would you recommend that if we are serious about getting the necessary reforms that we do, that one of the major planks of any future programme for government has to be a commitment, a root and branch reform to uh, the, the civil service and how we manage our de departmental output? Yeah, I, I, I would say it, ha it has to be, absolutely. I mean, I was I was really surprised by the absence of any mention of public sector reform overall or indeed civil service reform in the uh, programme for government. I think that's really disappointing. I suppose uh, perhaps to be to look on it um get to look on it sort of uh, charitably, maybe it's because uh, the the um is it is there's not much detail in the programme for government document. It is um, primarily about setting out a set of outcomes and 
So I'm sure that there is, well, I hope that there's an in intention to bring about transformation as part of achieving those outcomes. So if you set a goal about um, improving improving life chances for children and young people, for example, you know, that, that you would hope would involve looking at improving how public services are delivered for children and young people. So the fact that words are not there in the program, program for government, I think it is concerning, to be honest, but perhaps there, it's implicit and just hasn't been mentioned. Mm. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you for that. Matthew? Thanks, Chair, and thank you, um, as always, Anne. Fairly um, uh, use, useful but uh, bleak uh, in some ways, um, or most ways. Um, public sector, just to sort of take it in turn, public sector then civil service reform, and then I'd lastly want to get your views on how they're linked. In relation to public sector reform, you mentioned the VR voluntary exit scheme. What, you touched it a little bit on your evidence, but what's your judgment or Pivotal's judgment on whether that was a success or not? I mean, it was a success in the sense that people, it, it reduced the, the size of the headcount, but as an yeah. act of broader based public sector reform. I think the thing about voluntary exit schemes is, yes, they're set up to save money, you know, just to put it starkly, they're set up to, 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 to make um, expenditure savings, but you have to make sure that in making those expenditure savings, you don't take out the, um, the talent that you need from your workforce. And I think the, 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 the analysis I point to here would be the, um, uh, Northern Ireland Audit Office report on capacity and capability in the in the NICS in November 2020, and I think it it's saying you know, on the, the other side of the voluntary exit scheme, you've still got major problems with the civil service in terms of um, expertise, age structure, performance management, and so on. So, um, I don't know. I have, I haven't analysed that particular mm. voluntary exit scheme in any detail at all. Um, but if you look at what the NIAO are saying about the civil service now, it's not, uh, it doesn't have the, the, uh, all the appropriate skills that it, that it needs at the minute. And in relation to, um, well, that's definitely true. Okay, I, I'll come on to questions about the civil service piece in a second, I suppose, but um, on um, health service reform, uh, on the broad bits of public sector reform that are most urgent, you mentioned health, um, you mentioned education. Um, what would you like to see? I mean, as Steve said, we're in the last year of a mandate. It's questionable the extent to which the, the draft programme for government that's sort of circulating now is going to mean anything substantive in terms of getting this stuff done, albeit there was a statement yesterday from the health minister. But going into, like, for example, all being well and these institutions, you know, continue and, and there are elections and there's a new executive. What are the key things? I know you're apolitical and you don't kind of, but, but like what would be the, the kinds of policies you would want to see that new executive agree early? Uh, would it just be implementing Bengoa in full, a program of kind of multi-year budgeted uh, kind of education consolidation? What, it would be, just be helpful to have a couple of key headline policies? I think um, a new executive would have to be realistic about the demands on public services looking into the future, or even the demands now, to be honest, you know, the, 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 the funding problems that there are, the problems with poor outcomes that there are, and, you know, health waiting lists is the prime example of that. Um, and I think a new executive would have to be realistic about those situations and look beyond just the next 12 months and think, are we set for the next five years with ever increasing demand? You know, how, how are we possibly going to deliver public services by just continuing doing what we're doing at the minute? And so I would want to see, a re first of all, a, a, a recognition of that and a recognition of the need for change and reform. And I'd want to see really serious work done on what those reforms would be in practice. and. You know, in health and social care, there have been multiple reports. It just hasn't happened. Uh, the change hasn't happened. And so, you know, 
I wouldn't be encouraging more independent reviews because I think, frankly, we know what needs to happen and it's there in the Bengal report, but it hasn't happened as there hasn't been action. I think that that's that's true of health and social care. I think we know what needs to what changes are needed. It just needs to be uh, delivered, which involves making really difficult choices, which are potentially unpopular, which I assume is why it hasn't happened so far. Um, I think that's the case in health and social care. There's clarity about what needs to happen. Um, so I think a new executive should uh, really take uh, make a a serious commitment to those changes and and that's going to be about winning hearts and minds um, and and demonstrating to people that changing how health service is delivered and how different um, treatment are delivered how that is actually going to be beneficial for the service that people get there's obviously a perception at the minute that if all services aren't delivered everywhere then that's going to be uh, damaging for individ individuals or communities because there's not as much local provision as there was. But actually, in reality, we need to deliver for the whole of Northern Ireland and we need to have a much more specialised system as a, re as a result of that. Um, and do you think that a, the fiscal institutions, the fiscal council specifically, do you, would you like to see them playing a role in terms of, I suppose to put it candidly, giving a degree of political cover to, uh, or institutional cover to politicians who have to make those difficult decisions, would that be part of their role, do you think, or should it be? I think one, certainly one aspect of what the Fiscal Council will do is look at the sustainability of the, the public finances. So, um, you know, they'll comment on, 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 I suppose, one year's budget, but they'll also comment on what does this mean for uh, five or ten years down down the line? And I think that is going to be really helpful, I suppose, in, in shining shining a light on this question about um, can we continue to deliver services in the way we are now? Um, and I assume what they will be saying will be saying this is not uh, financially sustainable. And so we need to think, well, they may not go this far, but... Um, the, the next step would be, if this isn't financially sustainable, we need to deliver service, services in a different way, in a more in a more efficient way. Okay, and then if I may, Chair, just to briefly move on to the second bit, the, the broad waterfront you covered on, civil service reform. The NIAO, NIAO report that you referenced basically, and I'm obviously paraphrasing, talks, you know, describes a civil service which is candidly too old uh, is not talent managing people really at all um, and has a, a surreal uh, evaluation system which involves, while there are legitimate criticisms, and I'm sure you and Whitehall, like I did, had, you know, people have complaints about forced, the, the principle of forced distribution in various different boxes, but there's probably got to be a happy medium between forced distribution, people going into bottom boxes in a system where only a handful of people out of 20 odd thousand get unsatisfactory and everyone else just gets satisfactory. Um, is it fair to say that I mean, when you look at that report, um, it does seem to point to a, a civil service that's re in real structural crisis? Is that fair or am I overdoing it? Um, I think that certainly that report say there's massive issues here you know i think there's a huge issue about the age profile both in terms of not being representative of the population but also just practically about a few 45 year workforce is over 50 where you where are you going to be in in 10 years so there's a, a um a real urgency to get younger people in because of the skills and talents and insights and perspective that younger younger people bring to policy development and delivery so um I would say, you know, it it, it, it it seems really obvious to me that the, that that's a, that that's um, focusing on getting young apprentices or strikers or um, whatever or whether it's just general recruitment is an absolute. Thing. I think a performance management point. Um, I've always been a believer in performance management, not just as a process that helps you deal with 
poor performance, but actually as a really important process for everybody, that everybody benefits from good performance management. The, the best people benefit from good performance management because it helps them to be better. The people in the middle benefit because it helps them to address their weaknesses. You know, so you need, you need performance management, which is not just a stark, you know, you're satisfactory or you're not. And if you're not, you know, you're really a very poor performer. You need effective performance management that's helping everyone to develop. And I think that's what a good workforce strategy would do. I agree. And, and, and it's, it seems at times like the, the, their what happens in the Northern Civil Service is simply that they have no real idea actually in detail of who their not just their stars of the future are but within departments who who they see as the upper upper middle management and whether people who, who are the policy generals who are going to succeed and who are the specialists it feels like they're flying blind do you think some of the made the sort of difficulties in doing the big bits of is there any relationship between the issues around problems doing public sector reform that we've just mentioned and the unreformed civil service, the issues that we've just described, or is is the pro are the problems with public service reform mostly about politicians being not willing to take tough decisions? I would say the absence of public sector reform is largely due to politicians not leading that right. and not driving it forward and not looking beyond the immediate. So I wouldn't. I may be wrong about this, but I can just the absence of public reform to the civil service. But not that I'm sorry, I think about your question. Um, you could say that perhaps a more um, a more ambitious civil service and a more competent and able civil service would be more challenging to the ministers in the way that before you were talking about speaking truth to power, you know, maybe a civil service that was was um, stronger and more empowered would 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 feel able to challenge ministers more about that. But I would certainly put most of the responsibility for the lack of public sector reform on the politician servants. Okay, thank you, right. Alicia. Colin Castle Dirk. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, Wilson. Yeah, okay, go on, the chair. I would uh, thank you, Roman. You're welcome. And I was pleased to hang out in Ratchet and thank you for your statement as well. Just to share the point out, I was trying to get in uh, at our, our first presentation as well. Uh, Apologies, uh, Patricia. Sorry, I didn't, I, didn't see your, I didn't see the hand up. I, I apologise for that. The hand was raised from the beginning, but uh, 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 you didn't see it. I accept that. Uh, just uh, uh, and going back more or less on the same point again to this that Matthew was alluding to there. And uh, just as you were making your presentation and so on, uh, I'd write that kind of conclusion fairly quickly, uh, uh, even before you actually went on to explain. But uh, you actually said that the Department of Finance uh, would be mainly responsible, but it was a supportive and enabling role that they would have. Uh, therefore, that was implying like that uh, that leadership was actually meant to come from somewhere else, in a sense, right? Now, uh, I really feel as if that you've left uh, blame slowly nearly not exclusively, but mainly with uh, the politicians. Um, and I wonder at what level there, are you actually talking then about a politician who happens to be uh, a minister in place? Uh, should that be the person that's taking that leadership role in conjunction, we'll say, with the civil servants? And if it is, what is the likelihood then that we end up in the same silos that has existed in the past? Yeah, so... Um... I would say, it, just on your point about the uh, public sector reform division and the leadership they give within government, I would say they, they are, are, as I mentioned, they're enablers, they're supporters, they're not leaders, but that's not their fault. I'm not criticising them for that. They have not been asked to do that. Um, and so they, you know, they have not been asked by, by the executive, by, by the politicians to have that leadership role. Um, from what I can see, no one has an overall leadership role for public sector reform in Northern Ireland. Um, there's that enabling role for the Department of Finance and there's individual transformation teams in the Department of Health and the Department of Education, but there's no overall public sector reform strategy. And, and I think, you know, why has there not been public sector reform in Northern Ireland? I think that's probably your answer, that it hasn't been prioritised by politicians um, 
there isn't a there isn't the leadership on it there isn't a strategy and so it is happening in i suppose it's happening in certain areas or a, a little bit in some areas but um, not in a big cross government way well is that that level then uh, you know do we expect that to come from uh, say that the heads of departments, or do we expect that to come from, say, a, a particular party, or even uh, the executive bringing forward an initiative there? I suppose you, you know. Then, I guess, uh, uh, drive for change can come from any of those places. It, it most fundamentally, you would expect it to come from from. You know, as the, the as the political leaders, you would expect ministers to be saying, right, this is how I think the public services for which I am responsible, this is how I think they need to be changing to be to be sustainable into the future. So you would expect ministers in the first instance, but then you know, there's also a role for there's also a role for um uh, through committees, for example, you know, through this kind of conversation and through the, the um, influence that the committees have, there's a role for civil servants as well to be saying to ministers, this is, um, this is, these are the reforms that are needed, but ultimately it's up to politicians to make this kind of big scale important decision and to show this kind of leadership. If politicians aren't showing that leadership and aren't committing to public sector reform um, and making the difficult choices, then you can't expect, you know, there's no way you're going to get the civil ser civil servants wouldn't be doing it because they're not being instructed to do it by their ministers. Well, I'd have thought too, but that the civil servants are well placed in the very first instance uh, to know the, 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 the basic requirements. Uh, uh, and to advise, to say, a minister who in turn then can be supportive of them and implementing whatever reform it is that they would think uh, is required there. But again, actually right around full circle to making that same point, are we not just in the same sort of situation that we find ourselves in in the past, that we end up in silos, i.e. depending entirely on how um, responsive or reflective a particular minister and his top civil servant uh, are to uh, the need for that type of reform within a particular area or section? Yeah, I mean, I, I would have thought if, if the executive is going to take public sector reform seriously, then it needs to do it as an executive as a whole. There needs yeah. to be support right, right around the executive table for, for, for reforms and for what they mean for individual, individual departments. So yes, I mean, I think that, um, you're absolutely right. The, the siloed nature of government is is very damaging for effective public service delivery or indeed public service reform. Yeah, and I just thought it was at that level, maybe with the executive say, taking responsibility, that could be a driver. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I would go on then to say to you, just whenever we talk about uh, uh, the recruitment of young people and that into civil service and uh, that that recruitment should be reflective of society as a whole in many respects. Uh, uh, and I remember just in another presentation we had how uh, in England, I think it was uh, specifically, that they had a particular scheme there that uh, uh, addressed prisoners mm -hmm. and uh, having them recruited to the civil service and create an opportunity in that forum given the sort of uh, uh, barriers that were there in particular for prisoners. Well, in a society where we probably have more prisoners uh, per head of the population maybe than and other societies and so on, in particular where we have political prisoners and that as well, they have been confronted very often uh, with barriers in terms of employment and so on. And is there any sort of um, attempt been made there within the civil service at present uh, to possibly maybe even have a summer type scheme that, that which they have in England uh, and to embrace uh, that need uh, to support prisoners in that um, opportunity, you know, well, providing for them that opportunity and transition say, into, uh, into civil service and so on. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of that scheme in, um, in, in England or and GB, so I, I, don't, I don't know about that scheme in particular. I mean, generally, I'd be, you know, I'd be supportive of things which were seeking to to re rehabilitate people who've been in prison and give them opportunities. Um, but I don't know anything about that 
particular scheme. And I, I don't know, I'm not aware of any scheme within the Northern Ireland Civil Service. In the Northern Ireland Civil Service, I suspect that there isn't, but I think that there is a need for it. Mm -hmm. uh, you should think of that just as a pathways to employment for people and mm -hmm. in particular then uh, address the needs of those who are uh, experts and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay for you, young lady, but there's nothing wrong with being over 50. <laughs> <laughs> you, may be, you may be looking at this uh, from someone from a different age perspective, but as one who's well over it, I, I, I don't see anything wrong at all. I, um, and uh, I think we're in the first flush of uh, civil service youth. Um, Could I just say that? Um, could it be? Uh, can, can you still hear me? I just all I can see is a postage stamp. I can hear you. Okay. Yep. Um, could it be that simply Northern Ireland is too small a place to have a sufficient pool of expertise to recruit a, a diverse and experienced civil servants? We've got the population of Leicestershire. Uh, Leicestershire would be recruiting civil servants from a, from a potential of. 62 million people. The vast bulk of our civil servants are recruited from a, a small pool of 1.8 million. Is the fundamental mm -hmm. problem is that we're not recruiting enough civil servants from the rest of the United Kingdom? Um, I would say that uh, the idea of more interchange in and out of the civil service is a really important one. I think any organisation benefits from people coming in from outside and people going out and getting experience and developing their skills and getting a different perspective out um, working somewhere else. So I'd be encouraging of interchange in and out of the civil service, whether that with you know um, private sector or local government or the voluntary sector or whatever it is. So you know, I, primarily I would see that being within Northern Ireland, so people moving in and out of different jobs and roles in Northern Ireland and um, uh, bringing that experience to the civil service, it could also be it could also be um, you know interchange with the rest of the UK or with the Republic. Um, I think that would be really positive, and there was a lot of discussion before in the conversation with Alex Thomas that. Um, so I think that would be really positive. Um, <coughs> I guess you just have to think about the practicalities of that, of how easy is it for someone who lives in Edinburgh or lives in um, Essex to come and work in Northern Ireland when they have ties in, in, in those places. So, you know, I think definitely should be encouraged. Yes, um, but I would say primarily I'd be saying look at, look at getting much more interchange in and out of the civil service within Northern Ireland into different sectors, get people in who have experience from different things and really um, refresh the organisation in, in, in that way. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks very much, Irene. Uh, thanks very much, Irene. And no doubt we'll be talking again fairly soon as we go through. <coughs> about. Thank you very much, Irene. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, team, uh, moving on. Uh, the next item on the agenda is Department of Finance nearly zero energy buildings and energy performance building regulations. Uh, we have uh, John Burke and Billy Black, uh, Head of Building Regulations and Acting Head of Building Standards Branch. Uh, the following papers are relevant to this agenda item. Clark's briefing note on page 60, uh, Departmental Papers on Nearly Zero Energy Buildings on page 70, uh, Briefing note on page 90, and further Departmental Papers on the Proposed Programmes for Building on page 94. John, are you up? Hello, John Burke here. Hi, John. How are you? And are we oh. expecting Billy on as well? Ask Assembly Broadcasting to add Billy Black to the spotlight as well, please. Here we go. Hi, Billy. Hi, Chair. Can you hear me? I can indeed. John and Billy, thanks very much indeed. Uh, John, would you, are you going to be speaking first and could you make your opening statement, please? Thanks very much indeed. Um, uh, the opening statement is actually from Billy Back as uh, he's uh, head of the unit, so I'll pass over to him if you don't mind. All right. Thanks, John. Billy, over to you. Um, with, your, with your permission, Chair, um, I'll start. Um, so, 
Good afternoon, my name is Billy Black and I'm here with my colleague Joan Burke um, to provide a oral briefing uh, to the committee to follow up on recent written submissions of two briefing papers on proposals for, for NZEB uh, and for uh, Part F amendments to Part F of con conservation of fuel and power of the local building regulations and also its associated technical guidance. Uh, as acting head of BSB, I'm currently carrying out uh, the overall management role across the branches three units. You've already heard from us this year in relation to work of two of the units on fire safety and raid on matters following the consultation in October and on amendments to the energy performance of buildings, uh, certificates and inspections regulations, which was recently brought in to reduce lodgement fees. So John is um, managing the third unit and he's currently um, uh, has responsibility for a number of parts of the building regulations, including Part F, which is conservation of fuel and power. Some members of the committee may already be aware, but for your information, John and I will be attending the next meeting of the All Party Group on Climate Action on the 30th of April to provide a briefing on building regulations, Part F, and energy performance certification. So look, it's look, look forward to seeing you there. Today. Yeah, yes, thank you, Chair. So um, we provided a, a, a briefing document to the committee in February on nearly zero energy buildings and following this, a paper in March outlining the proposals for a longer term program of work, which has been published in the recent energy strategy uh, options consultation um, by the Department for Economy. Um, by the way, some further background, an initial building regulations work program was agreed in December 2019 uh, at the same time that the local building regulations advisory committee, that's NIBRAC for short, was, was being re-established um, after um, an absence of two or three years. NIBRAC exists under Article 4 of the Building Regulations Northern Ireland, Order 1979, the primary legislation to advise the department upon the amendment of building regulations and upon any matter arising out of or connected with the amendment or operation of building regulations, which may be referred to it by the department. We have sought to ensure a good representation of expertise from all the relevant areas of the Part F technical subcommittee, which leads on the provision of advice on these matters. The legislative work, legislative work program is to be implemented through a number of amending statutory rules with fire safety matters relating to an effective ban on combustible materials assessment in lieu of tests and read on issues being prioritised in the first statutory rule. Subsequent statutory rules are planned for fire safety and for um, the subject that we're talking about today, which is part of con conservation of fuel and power. It is envisaged that any statutory rule addressing Part F matters will not come forward until the next Assembly mandate. However, as part of the first phase of our programme, it is hoped to bring forward an initial uplift, uplift to the requirements provided in the Department's Technical Booklet F guidance uh, within this Assembly period. This um, will uh, outline new and increased provisions expected of new buildings in order to confirm with the current Part F legislation. To effect this work um, has been going on with NIBRAC and its technical subcommittees for Part F in these matters since early 2020, although it is only since November 2020 that clarity on the UK's position on uh, zero energy buildings provided the insight necessary to enable us to proceed with greater confidence along the lines we are now exploring. So Chair, if you're not content with that, uh, I would hand you over to John Burke um, to provide an overview and update of the current proposals. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Billy. John. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Chair. So um, our uh, most recent papers to provided uh, a provisional plan of uh, some of the phased uh, uh, if I start again, our most recent paper provided a provisional plan of phased uplifts to Part F, that's the conservation of fuel and power requirements of the building regulations, and uh, has recently been published in the Energy Strategies Options Consultation. The Department's initial focus, and where we're really uh, looking at 
quite intensively at the minute is on phase one of this to provide an uplift to technical booklet F guidance to the building regulations for new buildings within this assembly period if, if possible. The intention is to move quickly on this phase one given, the local, given that local requirements for new buildings have not been uplifted since 2012 while the GB administrations each implemented an uplift between 2013 and 2015 and are now looking to go further and the Republic of Ireland implemented uplifts in 2019. We also anticipate that our new guidance will provide a more robust approach in relation to Regulation 43B, nearly zero energy buildings, for which parts of local industry have been calling. It is equally important that proposals prove workable and set standards in keeping with the primary legislation's requirement to be reasonably attainable in practice. The Department's Building Regulations Advisory Committee, NIBRAC, and more particularly the, the, its technical subcommittee, which includes people with a, a very wide range of insights and interests, is continuing to advise officials. NIBRAC is the statutory body appointed to advise the department and further engagement with the other relevant stakeholders will also be held at public consultation stages. Details provided here and in committee or assembly briefings are therefore subject to change as proposals develop. So we're giving you a picture of where we are now, um, but we are still receiving inputs and advice from uh, NIBRAC. The department recognises that a more complex and fundamental review of Part F and Part K ventilation is necessary. We intend to explore a range of key issues by way of a phase two discussion document to gather evidence, particularly on local issues, and to indicate a longer term way forward. This will ask for feedback on issues such as the use of electrical grid factors, removal of local fuel factor relaxations, which were intended to assist off-gas grid developments, further strengthening of fabric energy efficiency standards, aspirations for embodied carbon assessments within buildings, discussions of heat pumps and renewable energy requirements for, um, for uh, building work. We would then expect to put forward proposals to take as much of the phase two feedback as possible into account alongside the latest developments elsewhere under a phase three comprehensive uplift plan for 2023. Phase three should provide further efficiency improvements as well as introducing new software to better reflect the decarbonisation of the electricity grid and adjustments such as new primary energy metric which will implement outstanding technical aspects of the energy performance of buildings directive which still need to be implemented. It will include consideration of standards where work is being done to existing buildings. Measures to provide for electric vehicle charging points at new buildings may also be brought forward around the same time, subject to DFI's consideration and lead. Phase four is likely to be taken forward in 2026-27 and would be intended to take England's 2025 proposals into account, as well as considering developments elsewhere. Phase five is likely to be taken forward in 2028, 29 to review and to consider if any of the proposals or any outstanding issues from phase two might need to be readdressed. So our phase one proposals, which we've written to you about or provided um, quite, a, quite a detailed briefing to you on, are, are therefore perhaps best viewed as an interim uplift, providing a stepping stone to more extensive changes a new software which we expect to have access to in light of developments in GB and elsewhere from 2022 onwards. For now, we are proposing to continue to use the existing, albeit outdated software, and not to take forward legislative change, given the relatively short period of time our local interim position is expected to be in operation. This should minimise industry adjustments and help enable faster implementation. The intention is to be as ambitious as possible within the, these limitations. So if I talk a little bit about the phase one proposals, the immediate things we're trying to focus on. So the principal metric for new buildings under our current Part F uh, assessment is a carbon dioxide emissions rate modelled using energy assessment software which has been developed by the UK government and then adopted here. The main expectation of any uplift therefore focuses on a better or a lower carbon dioxide emissions performance. We believe that on-site renewables such as photovoltaic panels will be a like their solar panels will be a likely outcome of any significant uplift as these are proving to be increasingly cost effective. We do not anticipate making them mandatory in this, mandatory in this phase as other solutions may be appropriate and acceptable providing the, provided the necessary carbon performance is achieved. 
Indeed, we intend to require improved fabric measures to further promote a fabric first approach and to help mitigate risks that excess renewables could permit undue relaxation of building fabric standards. We are considering proposals on a basis that the uplift could be delivered using some manual checks alongside the current assessments. And those would be A, a betterment of the current target emissions rate output provided by the existing software. And B, checks of the U values of the insulation in the walls, roof, floor and openings around the building to ensure that they meet new uplifted standards which we plan to provide in the amended technical booklets. Proposals appear to be resolving towards options for dwellings of around 25 to 40 percent betterment of the current emissions target, which we think ought to be deliverable within a three to five thousand pound impact cost per dwelling. However, this work is ongoing. Where betterment savings are from electrical energy, the actual carbon saving is likely to perhaps be less than the 25 or 40 percent figure, as the recent grid decarbonisation is not reflected in the current software assumptions. However, electrical savings provide a good outcome from a running cost point of view, and as a result, we anticipate a strong focus on in this area. In terms of fabric, we are currently considering uplifting the limiting U values or insulation values to levels similar to those in place in the Republic of Ireland and, and or Scotland. We are also seeking to progress on air tightness requirements and expect to encourage more testing. We are considering removing some of the current exemptions from testing as a pathway to mandating testing in future phases. We can also revise our ventilation requirements to better accommodate more airtight construction. We've also explored complex issues around renewable connections where export to the grid is not possible or is not provided. This is not a straightforward area and we are feeding information from this work into a liaison group of the administrations which the department has brought together as well as to the NIBRAC subcommittee. There has been some consideration of tapering of proposals for taller buildings where opportunity for improvements such as accommodating photovoltaic arrays may be more limited. Proposals for buildings other than dwellings may require a lower level of betterment to avoid overshooting standards subsequently coming forward from England in some specific building classes, notably buildings such as hotels with a high hot water heat demand. This information became available in late January under England's future buildings consultation. And we are currently investigating the detail further and liaising with the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. England's proposals also treat heat pumps differently to other installations. And again, we are taking this into consideration. So in terms of our current progress, we are now considering the impact assessment associated with the work. And having gained an understanding of the domestic costs, we're moving to evaluate benefits and savings. The non-domestic assessment is more complex, and we may seek industry consideration and feedback in this area in particular as part of our consultation package. The current relevant regulatory impact assessment pro forma, um, current methodology for our impact assessments developed by D DFE, the Department of the Economy, highlights costs and benefits to industry only. So although running cost savings for homeowners will appear, they will not uh, be included in the headline benefits figure. This together with our significantly larger homes here than in the UK, means that it is likely that the measures may not appear to benefit industry in the headline figures in the same way as elsewhere. We do, however, anticipate that the measures should be cost effective overall, i.e. they should pay back over the lifetime of their measures. But grid connectivity for renewable generating technologies is important if this is to be achieved successfully. Grid access and connectivity is not a matter central to building regulations, but we have brought NIE expertise into the technical subcommittee to try to assist with support in this area. And we continue to liaise with the energy strategy colleagues on these issues where possible. If renewable generating technologies, mainly photovoltaic solar panels, can't export or ensure that their energy is usefully used within the building, then our modelling suggests that any running cost savings from improved insulation and building fabric may be undone as more expensive low carbon solutions such as heat pump or electrical storage then have to be deployed to meet uplifted building regulations carbon emissions requirements. Running cost savings from improved fabric alone are unlikely to be as significant or as cost effective. So to quickly summarise, 
The immediate scope of phase one review is to implement an uplift to the technical booklet guidance to part F as applicable to new buildings as quickly as possible. The ambition is to bring forward all possible realistic steps of improvement whilst acknowledging that a much more fundamental review of part F and part K on ventilation will be required. Continuance with the current software and legislation is viewed as a short-term interim position to assist with this. The current status of the review is ongoing, with impact assessment work underway and technical liaison and advice being provided by the NIBRAC Specialist Subcommittee. Further information will be made available to everyone once a consultation package of proposals is developed and when the department would be grateful for further input, of course. But in the meantime, we'll certainly be happy to take any questions, feedback or comments from the committee to consider and to feed back to uh, NIBRAC. Um, just a couple of questions. Thanks very much indeed for your comprehensive briefing. Um, the fact that we've already got an energy consultation <coughs> going on at the moment about future energy strategy and where we're going for energy strategy. Communities is looking at sort of upgrading the social housing and sort of um, uh, jump-starting the social housing construction market. Uh, the Department of Agriculture is also dealing with climate change legislation and there's a private member's climate change bill that's coming through that's looking towards uh, 2045. You know, the UK as a whole is going towards 2050. To what degree of coordination are you is happening now across all these aspects of it? Because you know, we need to be able to have a, a fully joined up approach to this. And a number of times you've talked about the issues to do with grid connection, the ability to sort of export or else the sort of the economics of it doesn't work. And I think there's a, I know there's a particular member of this committee who also takes a close interest in grid connections and some of the problems we've had with sort of renewables and connections as well. How joined up are we at the moment? What's the degree of coordination you're doing with the other departments? And is there, is, is there an approach about a centralised position? That's the first question. The second question is, we appreciate we've only got a year left of this mandate. When we come back to be able to achieve the goals that we must achieve that are mandated across the whole of the United Kingdom by 2050, to achieve those goals, we really need to have all, you know, a sizable chunk of our, uh, the reduction in carbon emission and the rest of it has to come from sort of the housing stock and the building stock and the big building regulations. How ready are we to go with the necessary legislation that we will need to have out the door uh, come sort of June 2022? Okay, so um, on your first question then, which is about being joined up with, with the other departments and, and their efforts. So I'm sitting in the energy efficiency uh, work stream of the energy strategy and try to feed that through Elias, um Frequently, probably every every week or so, and try to try to communicate with colleagues on the um, heat work stream from the same the same group. Um, so people in DFE are, are very familiar with me and with uh, uh, my goings on or or, 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 or my cam campaigns on, on on the issues relevant to building regulations and where we're at and how we need to have that uh, 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 greater um, uh, joined up. Work, I suppose, uh, and um, but equally, they they would have a lot of issues where they're asking for building regulations to take lead. So there's a, there's a lot of chicken and egg, and I think we really have reached a, a position in uh, building reg regulations where where um, we we need to um, mix metaphors very badly. We need to start making a bit of an omelette here and and start get doing something to to uh, move things along. Um, so. Uh, we're reasonably hopeful that the proposals we're putting forward in phase one here um, will incentivize um, uh, the um, electricity industry and the uh, su supply uh, uh, side of things to uh, facilitate and improve grid connections if possible. Um, uh, really, it's not our territory to to require it, um, but we're we're aware that if it if it can't happen, it's going to have greater and greater impact. Um, it's somewhat not on a, unlike or on a, on a, unlike situations you've probably had in each of your own constituencies, where perhaps developments haven't been able to occur because the sewage infrastructure or something isn't isn't adequate. It's 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 not quite as good as that, or quite as as grave necessarily as that 
but it will mean that those developments where that grid connectivity is maybe particularly expensive or can't be easily facilitated, it may mean that they have to look at other more expensive alternatives, you know, really, really highly insulated buildings um, or uh, using heat pumps or something, which is likely to perhaps make the building more expensive to run. So um, we would hope that what we're, what we're trying to do is get the balance right in this uplift to, to get things shifted and to get it started and to get it moving. Okay. Um, in terms of your program, um, and we're liaising where we can and joined up, and we're also, I think this is very important, um, trying to be joined up with the other, the other administrations, particularly with the Ministry of Housing Communities and local government. So, um, for example, the new software that they're bringing forward in 2022, um, uh, and their uplift for 2022, we're reviewing that now, um, and we're taking cognizance of that, and, and making sure, or trying our best to make sure that nothing we do at this stage puts that subsequent step in jeopardy. We're also highlighting um, our issues about grid connections and things, which do seem to be a particularly Northern Ireland uh, um, issue. So where we don't, where, where, where we where we have those kind of concerns being expressed to us with a, a more North, in a more Northern Ireland context, <laughs> we're certainly feeding them back so that the next stage ought to be um, at least, you know, we're, we're having a mind to that next stage as, as we go forward. Um, so as soon as we can get this phase one out, out, away, we'll be, we'll be starting to draft the, the legislation and the guidance and everything else that follows through. Really, to follow on with that, we, we could really do with seeing England's uh, final versions of their equivalent guidance, so, so that we can bring that all in um, correctly and, and uh, mirror, mirror that or reflect upon it, let's say, and have that and present that back to the Brack and then see what their problems are, what the issues are, okay. and work that forward. But that, that, that work and that expectation, the Brack's primed for it as best we can, um, and um, you know, our, our team is too. Um, but as I say, our, our real focus now is to try and get this phase one through, to try and, um, I think we need to try and inject some momentum into progress on this. Okay, thanks very much. Today. That's what Facebook's intended to do. Okay, thanks, Paul. Yes, thank you, and, and I note your passion uh, for this subject, so uh, uh, you can see it coming through on the screen, so thank you very much for that. Uh, just to keep on that issue about connection, the big issue in Northern Ireland is purely policy-driven. It's, it's the policy that we have, uh, and we are where we are, and other jurisdictions don't have this same policy, but we are, uh, we are developer led with regards to development of grid and what I mean by that if it's not transmission then uh, you're basically when when a, a company wants to build a plant it's they and only they that pays for that connection uh, and then what happens is if a business comes in maybe even a rival manufacturer for that matter comes in and plants themselves in the field next to that developer who paid for that line then they can tap into that line practically for very little. Uh, so there's certainly not fairness in the scheme uh, in, in the way we do the policy at the present time. And it might be an idea to look at some sort of, dare I say it, incentive scheme whereby you can assist a developer uh, and incentivize them to go to a certain place in Northern Ireland and maybe even tap into a certain place in the grid in order to build out the grid in a better way. Uh, and that way you might get to the point where the money you spend on the incentive scheme might well help to incentivize and direct exactly where we need the grid. Uh, I, I know that's not your expert, I know that's not your responsibility, so I'm not gonna ask you a question on that. But, but it does lead to fundamental questions around what you guys are doing in trying to conserve fuel and power and try and create this zero, uh, uh, nearly zero uh, uh, regulation. How, uh, the questions I will ask is this, how, how will this affect demand going forward? Because if we're going to conserve fuel and power, then you would think there would be a reduction on demand. 
And if we're going to push buildings and new buildings into particular uh, requirements, then surely demand will go down. So if demand's going to go down, do we know yet how much demand will go down? Because that will impact on a lot of a lot of issues, not least our power plants and our generation uh, requirements. So would you, if I could comment on that, that, that uh, it, it's fascinating what you're saying, but um, SOMI, I know, has a consultation in hand looking at the wider transmission location issues uh, and that the um, systems operator for Northern Ireland. So I, I'm sure you'd be interested in that, but that is very much work for another for, for others in, in other departments. Um, when you When you talk about demand going down, we see demand going down very much in higher carbon fuels. So that's people perhaps using less gas and, and certainly um, by 2025, we really want to try and get away from oil boilers. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but, but the shift is then from high carbon fuels to low carbon fuels. And what we find then is that the electricity grid is decarbonizing and has decarbonized so much that the expectation in my mind is, um, my understanding of the expectation is that despite putting on photovoltaics on, on the roof, um, the sun won't always be shining. So the, the, the common expectation between that and electric vehicles um, would be that really we will have more and more uh, of an increasing uh, demand and a, a much more uh, need for more electrical power. The power will shift from high carbon gas and oil to low carbon electricity. Um, whilst we may try to reduce the extent of that, things like cars, um, and uh, if we move to electrical heating um, with uh, heat pumps, um, that is uh, probably going to outweigh any savings that that, that, that you uh, you know in terms of you just look at pure electrical load um, on a building. The electrical load is likely to go up as a result of that, even if you've saved the overall energy reduction. So. I would be very surprised even to, to, to be, I don't think anyone in industry is thinking in terms of a, 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 a reduced grid or a less, uh, less demand on the grid. Um, there, there may be problems in balancing that and um, those balancing problems are a, are a real um, contentious and tricky issue for us about how, how does one score a building if it has um, batteries uh, with its photovoltaic should 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 will it have a better carbon performance than one which which only has photovoltaics and doesn't have that battery storage? Um, you know, how do you how do you get all those metrics and things balanced? And for a lot of this, we have to look back to MHCLG and the national calculation methodology, and hence the software that they're doing in 2022, and that's what we're then engaging with them on in advance or, or with it, that for, slight foresight to, to, to that. Thank you. A very fascinating subject. Do you know also how then it will impact, and I, and I get what you say about rebalancing of demand to the uh, electric vehicle, the transportation piece, um, and, and the less, the more efficient uh, domestic and non-domestic dwellings or, or factories. Do you know how it will affect the network costs, which are widespread and uh, accrued across the, the, uh, the non-domestic uh, business sector, how, how this will impact. So, so if we're encouraging people to go off grid, if you like, or, or to reduce their grid reliance and to become more sustainable, a self-efficient way, then, then that will have a knock-on effect on network charges because that pot is, is what it is. It, the cost doesn't change. But if you're going to reduce the share of people paying, it, paying that, then you put a greater burden on the people who stay fully gridded. Uh, now, that might be, again, a way of incentivizing people to go off-grid. But have you, have, has anybody worked out any measurements and any... any so, effects. So, so I'm, I'm afraid, no, again, that really is, you know, DFEs and utility regulator and um, energy electrical uh, colleagues um, uh, work piece in, the, in that area. 
what I would say is that when we're looking at, at, at adjustments, so if, if we're looking at um, a factory or a, or, a, or a warehouse, or for that matter, a detached house, um, and when we're putting our photovoltaic array on the roof and modeling out how that might work and how that might feel or how that might work to our, in our cost be benefit impact assessment, we need it to be able to be grid connected and to be exporting. Um, so, so it's not moving yet to a kind of autonomous or um, uh, off grid entirely led uh, levels of solution. Yeah. We're finding that, that when we come to have to put on batteries or if we don't get that export connection provided, yeah. we, uh, we, we, we find it very difficult to get it to be a justified an uplift to that level or to, to justify a solution based on a solution like that yeah um so 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 that's we're, we're not kind of getting to, to quite that level but it is an issue that that could impact on the non any non-domestic proposals that we're putting forward which again is partly why our non-domestic proposals are likely to be less um less extensive i suppose or, le or less less uh, a, a, a lower level of betterment and what we were looking at for houses. When you um, say, when you houses. say, sorry, when you say your responsibilities are non-domestic, does that include agriculture and broader houses? Well, actually, agricultural buildings are exempt from building regulations, generally speaking. So, no, it would be more um, factories, warehouses, shops, hotels, general buildings. But agricultural buildings are explicitly exempt. Is that, does that, now I can understand probably why and there's a historical context to that, but does that alarm you? Given, given that yes. when you talk about carbonisation, decarbonisation, agriculture is a big player? Um, well, we're, our, our concern is really about buildings with a high, ener high, high energy intensity. No, I, I'm I'll maybe you not expert enough that I understand there would be poultry sheds and various things where there might be a, a high energy demand, but I think the common expectation is that that is that that energy demand is really there as a kind of um, process load. So in our, in our building regulations world, again, it's quite complex, but in our building regulations world, we're, we're, we're limited to the heating, ventilation, cooling and lighting for that building in common in common circumstances, we're not there. We wouldn't be normally taking into account um, the energy needed for the arc welding in the factory. Nor, yeah. nor would we be there, I suppose, for the for the energy and the heat input maybe provided if it's explicitly for a for an agricultural function as such. Yeah. So, so why I um, ask that question is because I'm quite alarmed because with the debate around the closure of the RHA scheme for the broader houses and for all recipients. There seems to be a trend now going towards coal-fired heating to replace the, ga the, the, the wood pellet, the RHA. Uh, are, are you seeing any of that, or, or should you see any of that, given it's not your responsibility? Would that be something that you would detect? And if you're detecting it, are you alarmed by it? So it isn't something we would detect. Um, district councils implement and control the building regulations, so we would meet them quarterly. It's not something. Um, again, they wouldn't be involved in that when it's when it's an agricultural building. Um, uh, so I don't I don't think it's and it's certainly not something they've they've raised with us. Um, if if a new heating installation is put into a building which is subject to the building regulations, then there would be you know, a set of efficiency requirements and that kick in with that. But it's it's not quite the level of assessment that would apply to new buildings okay. um, and it would be related to the, a, 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 a guidance document called the Non-Domestic Building Services Compliance Guide um, and, and they would look to that and they would have to fulfil those, those efficiency standards there. But the, 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 the agricultural buildings sector is, is really, um, has, ha, is and always has been, your, I can't altogether explain why, but it is and always has been exempt from building regulations. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Philip? Philip? Thanks, Chair. Uh, and thanks, John and Billy, for the presentation. Uh, to, be, to be honest, I had a number of uh, substantive questions, but uh, the Chair and Vice Chair have covered most of them. Uh, I just want to just comment then, saying, I mean, this is really important 
it's really important work. I have an association with the Private Members Climate Change Bill uh, as a co-sponsor, so I look forward to his coming to ABT on climate change. And in terms of the presentation, I mean, there's, there's a, a raft of figures and reductions, percentage reductions within various sectors. I'm, I'm just wondering, have you any kind of calculations at this stage of you know the implementation of this and how you, it is likely to reduce the overall carbon tonnage that we produce in the north as you know of say for example we have a target of 2045 for net zero i mean have you any calculations about how these uh will impact on that and secondly just uh, firing all my questions on at once i mean you're you, i know you've covered it you've talked about uh bringing forward change to guidance rather than regulation so i'm just wondering uh, in terms of how that will ensure compliance uh, and then, th just lastly, I mean, you talked about obviously th this is cross cutting, and, and you, you, you'll be looking for information from the FA with regard to whether uh, electrical points and new buildings is going to be brought forward quickly. I mean, I, I would er certainly urge that. I mean, that's a common complaint that I would have in terms of people trying to move uh, quicker to electric vehicles. Is that, you know, we, we just need more uh, quicker uh, electric charging points. So thanks for that. So in terms of carbon tonnage, that's exactly the phase we're moving on to now. Our, our, our software is outputting some of those figures. Um, I'd have to, I could come back to you on that if, if uh, needed for the next presentation. Um, we should have a bit more uh, data in that through. Um, as I say, one thing I have to caution is we're not as reducing uh, the um, carbon output as such in the in that just be mindful we're reducing the extent to which it's increasing you we're all adding a building you know so so um sometimes we have to be careful um people can think that, that we're that, that this change is somehow reducing northern ireland's target it's really slowing down the rate of of, of growth of carbon output zero will be in the key phrase yeah so, so um we're aware we're, just be just be mindful of that we're looking at, as I say, 25 to 40 percent figures in and around that zone. As the consultation comes through, um, it, we'll be able to give you something more on that. To some degree, it will depend where individuals decide to make the saving. So, um, if, for example, as we suspect is likely, most people will choose to try and make the saving through, as we've talked about, putting on photovoltaics or, so, or, or as well as the fabric improvements that, that we have as well, which are very important. But if a ch large chunk of the saving is done from uh, electrical savings, that 25 or 40 percent is, isn't likely to actually be achieved because the current carbon factors for electricity in the existing software hasn't been readjusted to reflect that decarbonized grid. If that makes sense, so, so, so the, the the you know do twenty five and forty might be the kind of headline figure. It might not actually quite achieve that, um, the, the, if the savings are all done in, in in electrical terms. You talk about the guidance versus regulation, um, which um, I think that if you were to ask the com common uh, uh, architect or people working in practice when they talk about the building regulations. Um, 99 out of 100 of them will, will reach for our technical guidance. The, the guidance to most working people in their daily activity um, is, is the book, the technical booklet is what they use. And the technical booklet gives standards of performance for um, which if, if you meet that standard of performance, it will be deemed to have complied with the requirements of the regulation in most normal circumstances. It would be pretty unusual for buildings to vary from that, and particularly in relation to um, our Regulation 40 and Regulation 43, is Regulation 43 is the NZ, and Regulation 40, the relatively prescriptive regulations. So they're saying you have to meet the target, and then the guidance says, well, the target is. You know, so it's pretty hard to see how, how in in practice, there would actually be any kind of um, loosening or, or removal or away from that. Um, and then your last question was about incentivising and encouraging electric vehicle points. So um, we are aware England have a, a consultation out, or had a consultation out on that as of the Republic of Ireland. And um, really, we need, we, we're, we're working with uh, DFI. And both those people or both those other administrations are really looking for departments for transport to lead 
and we're offering our building regulations as a legislative tool to try and help them get some of these requirements uh, delivered. And there'll be a bit of a debate as to whether one provides just the ductwork supply or so that a cable could be pulled through, whether the building, to come back to some of the um, uh, issues raised by, by, I think it was Paul Frew, was it there, the uh, uh, vice chair, um, coming back to that, whether you actually require the electrical supply to be provided to the house on the assumption then that the electrical vehicle will be there. You know, so you've got this additional load built into the local grid that you're building. I think that that, that would be a kind of expectation and come parks back to this idea that you need to design for that additional load now and be building with that in mind, not building with a, with a lower requirement because electric vehicles aren't really that common. Um, you, you need to get that in. Um, uh, or, or one can go the whole hog and, and require the actual charging point smart, ready, and all the rest sitting there ready to be plugged in. You know, But those are decisions which would be for our Department for Transport or here at the Department for Infrastructure to, to sort of adjudicate on and do the impact assessment for and, and, and consider the impacts and issues around that. We, we're offering building regulations, I think, as a bit of a legislative vehicle to help deliver that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Steve. Thanks, Philip. Anissa? Lisa, can you hear us? Yeah, Chair, yeah. Yeah, you've got can it. You okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, and John, thank you uh, for your presentation as well, too. Uh, just uh, some other factors. I don't know why or not that you exactly have uh, included them in your all of your considerations and so on. I'm sure that you have, but uh, take even in terms of the construction of new buildings and so on, and the materials that that's going to be required for it. Uh, uh, Listen to will say both the supply of the materials, i.e., whether or not that they'll be produced here at home uh, on the island of Ireland, or whether they're imported from abroad. And that um, uh, has has that been taken into consideration? Um, so, at this stage, no is the short answer. Um, uh, it wouldn't really be a matter that has been uh, considered. The topic of embodied carbon, i.e. The, the amount of carbon that goes into a material, you know, to, to get it, to get it uh, both in its manufacture and construction, and whether there should be an embodied carbon uh, requirement. The Royal Institute of uh, British Architects and the RSUA, the Royal Society of Ulster Architects, and I know that the Irish Green Building Council are, are, are trying to look at this. Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors have introduced a new methodology and provide additional guidance following on from a, a I think it's a PASS standard, a publicly accessible set. There's a whole, it's a, it's a whole other world to, to enter and, and there are PhDs galore on how that all gets done and assessed and what, what, what um, replacement costs and things should be used, what frequencies, all this kind of, there, there's, there's a whole world in there. We're keen to try and see if because there's been such a lot of pressure on it and because as the energy requirement of the building, in other words, as the carbon emissions from the building reduce from the proposals we're putting forward in phase one, the carbon impacts of the materials become proportionally more significant. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so we're keen to try and see if we could at least open a conversation on that in our phase two discussion document, which we're starting, which we have some early drafts of, in which we've started to pass by uh, NIBRAC uh, when, when we get a gap. If we've ever had a gap, we've passed that through NIBRAC. Um, and for, for a, a, an initial bit of discussion, so, so it's, it's a, I think it is a longer term topic um, uh, that, that, that would be um, keen to try and adopt. And I know that it was certainly a response to some of the proposals that came through from England recently for, for uh, greater efforts on that. Um, and in that way, the local material should ought, ought to be able to demonstrate, you know, that, that it has travelled less far, or that its its embodied energy here would maybe perhaps be less than had you imported material from Poland or uh, the United States or or whatever. So that, that that might help the local market. That would be about as that would be about as close to that area of activity, I suppose, as as we're kind of thinking of. 
In other general terms, we'd need to try and do. It would be great to see um, further um, efforts on kind of training and skilling and upskilling and that of locals uh, to try and get some of these newer technologies, particularly heat pumps um, and mechanical ventilation and heat recovery, um, operating effectively. And so you had those sort of sort of local skills, uh, indigenous and in place. As I say, building regulations. There's a bit of tension between groups who think building regulation should be driving and cutting forward and changing industry, but actually our principal legislation is there to say, you're there to set the standards that can be reasonably be expected to be attained. And so it, it's really quite helpful if there is a well-established you know, methodologies and, and practices and industry standards in, a, in advance that we can then um, adopt and move to, if that, if that makes sense, that there's sufficient scale and capacity out there for us to justify that we've met the requirement of our principal legislation, that this is something that can be reasonably be attained. So again, local materials should be available more locally. So you would like to think that that will justify, you know, if there were, if there were local, I suppose, if there were local materials or industries or people at work doing progressive things, the likelihood is that, that you would be better able to accommodate that if it's yeah. up and running at scale. Well, I actually think of that, that too, just in terms, not only of local material, but local expertise, uh, mm -hmm. and either developing uh, the materials or even uh, in, uh, not only in manufacturing, but in, in the construction of the very buildings and that as well too. Uh, as we would like the example that's been used there constantly, say uh, about the electric cars, uh, well, it's grand, but if no one knows how to build them, <laughs> you know, uh, there isn't much point in sort of uh, having that as your standard. Uh, so that uh, it's something that I do think that uh, uh, and a cost benefit analysis should be uh, assessed as well to to what extent are we prepared for it, uh, and to ensure that we are prepared to meet the demands uh, of of, uh, of um, uh, uh, achieving. Uh, the zero energy um, buildings and the likes of it, you know, have we, have we the expertise there? And uh, is it, uh, again, a new job creation type uh, opportunity as well, too, so in so many areas? Uh, is that the case? And that type of analysis, I think, is actually required as well. Uh, one final question just on that, too, um, that in relation to uh, um, the standards that we would hope to achieve, uh, is that as is expected within uh, the European Union uh, currently. Sorry, I, I missed that. I, it just broke up a wee bit. Say that again. Is that is that is, is that the same as what is expected? We'll say from within the European Union currently. And so, so the so the is what is expected? We'll say within the European Union and what we'd be hoping to achieve here in the north of Ireland. So the the EU. Um, that's a general generic aspiration. Sorry, I'm back in echoing. It's a generic aspiration, but it's up to each member state to set its own uh, target for its for itself. Um, yeah. And uh, different regions will have different performance requirements with their climate and all sorts of things to, to scale and to measure off. So I, I can't turn around and say um, we're fantastic. Um, clearly, we're not in terms of GB, in terms of the Republic. Um, so, in, in that context, you know, we're that little step behind England. So, 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 so uh, and we need to catch up. We, I think that's acknowledged, um, and we need to do so quickly. Um, in the, the 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 uplift that we're proposing is really trying to say, well, this is the what's the best, what's the most pragmatic steps we can do, um, straightforwardly, quickly now. And get that that extra uh, to get us um, into a more robust position, and to prepare that industry as a stepping stepping stone. I, I don't think, and I can't I can't offhand find. I'm sure it exists a document that lists perhaps I don't know the carbon performance or the primary energy performance expected of a new dwelling in in each different area, but that the target and the number tends to change with the size and the shape of the building. So you wouldn't have a, it, it's quite a complex area, but you, you don't have a fixed, for example, passive house standards have a, have a fixed requirement. I think, I think it's something like 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year 
of, yeah. of an energy space heating requirement. Now we're, we're not we're not near that at the minute, but um, our target, however, changes with the size and shape of the building. So if you have a long, thin building with lots of exposed walls and and roof, you maybe don't get penalised for that in the way that the passive house system would. That's why it has a fixed figure. Um, yeah. And the methodology in that that we're using is in compliance with the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. So that is that is in turn. My understanding is that that is in turn prescribed by the by the EU's way of doing business. Are we following the EU's way of doing business? Yes, it is. You know, the methodology at the minute is and is expected to be going forward for now because that's what the UK is doing and Ireland is doing similarly. So, so that's the that's the expectation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed, uh, Billy and John, for um, an excellent uh, set of evidence. And I think we have all learnt a lot more in the last uh, forty odd minutes than uh, I think uh, we've, and it's really improved our understanding of the complexities and difficulties we have. But thank you very much indeed, and look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, team, uh, we need to sort of make a bit of a counter on now. If we're still to be here today. <laughs> Uh, I just want to move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, there's a written briefing on statutory rule 21, uh, 2172 energy performance certificates. The statutory rule 202172, the energy performance of buildings, certificates and inspections amendment regulations Northern Ireland 21 is at page 115, which amends the energy performance of buildings uh, regulations 2008. The, redu the rule reduces the statutory fees that are charged when data is registered for domestic and non-domestic energy performance certificates, display energy certificates and air condition inspection reports. The changes were made from the 1st of April 2021. The rule was subject to draft affirmative assembly procedure. The assembly affirmed the rule on the 10th of March 2021. Is the committee content to note? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, the committee will now be asked to consider a number of SRs relating to COVID business supports. At page three of the tabled items is a letter from the Minister advising in respect to LRSS overpayments and the complexity associated with changes to lockdown. Departmental officials will speak to this and to the relevant SRs. Uh, can I bring Ian and Alan in on the spotlight, please? Hi, Ian. Good to see you again. Good afternoon. Alan? Yep, I'm here. Thanks, Chip. Oh, good. Right. OK. Uh, Ian, Alan, would you like to sort of make your presentation? OK, Chair, I'm going to um, start. Um, uh, and with your permission, I'm going to cover agenda items number 11, 12, 13 and uh, 15 to start yes, with, please. which are the statutory rules on the, um, the additional business support schemes. Um, so agenda item 11 um, is SR 86. That is in relation to um, a new grant scheme to support medium-sized industrial businesses. Um, so the, um, uh, the intention with this scheme is that um, any industrial business with a net annual occupying premises with a net annual value of between um, £15,001 and £51,000 will be entitled to uh, a one-off grant payment of £25,000. Um, this will then um, bring the industrial premises in that NAV band into line with the uh, kind of retail, tourism, hospitality and leisure businesses that received a similar size grant in the in the first lockdown um, and also then um, support those businesses that weren't able to access any funding in the spring of 2020. Um, it is something which has been uh, lobbied for and requested by Manufacturing NI and is very much welcomed by businesses in that in that sector. Um, item 12 um, is SR88, uh, that is in relation to um, a grant scheme for um, businesses occupying large NAV properties. Um, this is for any business um, occupying a premise with an NAV over £51,000, um, um, which has uh, not been in receipt of a grant previously um, uh, under the COVID funding uh, regulations um, and therefore it won't include those businesses in that NAV band who are currently in receipt of the large tourism hospitality business support scheme that uh, DFE is uh, running at the minute. Um, so the payment in each case is going to be £50,000 uh, for, for those businesses. Uh, estimate that there are around about um, 1,050 businesses in that category. Um, including a broad range of um, uh, 
uh, retail um, leisure type businesses uh, like gyms and fitness suites, question centres, caravan parks, um, which wouldn't be entitled to other grants, uh, and also industrial premises within that NAV band. Uh, at agenda item 13, we have um, uh, SR87. And this is in relation to a proposal or sorry, a grant scheme which is going to provide um, additional payments to those businesses which received either the £10,000 or the £25,000 grants in the spring of 2020 um, who are not currently in receipt of the localised restrictions support scheme funding or the coronavirus restrictions business support scheme part B funding that is run currently by uh, Department for the Economy and Invest NI. Um, so those would be businesses which are not currently required to close by the restrictions uh, that are in place at the minute, but have been affected um, because of the restrictions. Um, so there will be a number of types of essential businesses, for example, um, ones that uh, currently uh, are, uh, or have been having some difficulties in, in regular contact with us, or people like dry cleaners, for example, um, who have seen a large part of the trade drop away, but um, are allowed to remain open as essential businesses and uh, have been struggling consequently. So the idea with this scheme is that it will support those businesses who have struggled but haven't been able to access the current support in the second wave of the pandemic. And then agenda item number 15 uh, is SR89, and that is in relation to soft play businesses. Um, so uh, soft play businesses were required to remain closed over the summer months as most sectors of the economy reopened. Um, so they were uh, only allowed to reopen again in the on the 14th of September of 2020. Um, and then the restrictions in the second wave started to come in again from the early part of October. Um, so there was a similar scheme that the Department of the Economy established for uh, so-called wet pubs, um, which had also been required to remain closed over the summer months and into September. Um, and this is a kind of a, a, a sort of a, a counterpart to the, that scheme for this particular class of businesses, soft play. Um, so in order to make sure there's a kind of equity across the different business sectors, um, this scheme will provide those businesses uh, which were required to remain closed um, 10 weeks worth of funding to cover the period between the 4th of July and the 14th of September um, at the LRSS weekly rates. Um, so in effect, that means um, a one-off payment of either 8,000 or 12,000 pounds for the businesses that are eligible for it. So happy to take any questions any of the members have about those, those schemes. Okay, Ian, thanks very much indeed. And thank you again for sort of the hard work that the department's done. I know that you're supposed to be a money taker rather than giving a money giver, but uh, I think, but just by my sums, that's 176.9 million that needs to go out to business for COVID and the rest of it, and it is desperately needed. But just a couple of questions. Um, sort of, what about payments for grants to businesses with multiple uh, premises? Are there any sort of views on those? Um, the, the schemes as they are constructed and as the, the regulations have, have gone through and been made um, make provision for one payment for each business um, regardless of the number of premises they have. So if um, you are a, a retailer, for example, with a number of large NAV properties, um, maybe 10 or 12, um, you will receive one grant rather than, than multiple grants. Now, um, Retail ANI and a number of local businesses have been uh, in contact with the Minister um, on this subject and the, the Permit Secretary has met with them in the early part of this week. Uh, and she's asked him to come back with a, a proposal for how we might possibly deal with that particular um, issue um, because they have raised um, what they consider to be um, some challenges around that, um, which are that each one of those premises will have costs and, and several large retailers, for example, will be, will be running at large deficits at the minute uh, and may place some of them in jeopardy. Um, so the, the Permanent Secretary has asked them to come back with a proposal um, and we're waiting for that to come in. And when we receive it, then we'll consider it. Of course, we have to then look at how that might affect the other grant schemes at different um, uh, property sizes as well, uh, and what's affordable within the budget that's available to support um, support businesses from the COVID fund. Okay, thanks. Uh, what's the sort of the time scales for payments? Because uh, you've probably been like me, sort of looking at your Twitter feed and seeing the remarks from the Minister for Health that uh, hopefully we're heading for more. Uh, opening up of businesses mm -hmm. and a lot of services in the sort of in the shorter rather than the medium term. So, what sort of timescales are we looking at? Sort of, uh, Ian? 
Okay. Okay. So uh, we have to get these schemes established to get them up and running. So the the regulations have now been made. So we have the legal authority to do it. Um, we have to identify the businesses that would be entitled to receive the funding and open up applications, uh, especially in the case of the large NAV scheme. Um, but we're attempting to make the payments automatically to a number of others. Uh, we have at the same time got to obviously maintain the LRSS scheme and the payments and, and deal with the, the complications of those uh, relaxations that you've just mentioned there and how we're going to make sure that the, the, the current recipients continue to receive the money. So um, what we're hoping is that the payments to the soft play businesses will issue by the end of this week. Um, that we will be in a position next week, by the end of next week, to open for applications for the large NAV scheme. And in the um, start, uh, first half of May, we'll be able to start to release payments to the uh, industrial premises. And, uh, and then after that, the top up payments to the previous recipients of the £10,000 grant. And then after that, the uh, top up payments to the recipients of the previous £25,000 grant. Um, and that hopefully will be um, achieved by the middle of May. That's our current timetable. So there's a, a tremendous amount of work has to be done there, um, whilst we simultaneously maintain the payments to the LRSS recipients and also deal with the start of the rating year as well. Ah, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, so that's going to make, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be challenging. Have you got the resources to do it, Ian? Um, well, we have set up a, a separate team inside LPS now to, to look after the COVID business support scheme, sort of a temporary team. Um, but of course, we, we have a, a limited number of staff inside LPS. Um, I think the last time I was in front of the committee in November, you asked me about our staffing position. Um, and I told you at the time we only had 72% of our posts permanently filled by a substantive member of staff. Well, that, that situation hasn't really changed. Um, so we, we have had uh, to go to other parts of the department to bring in additional staff, although the, the numbers involved are, are relatively small at this point. So um, we hope that by organising um, some of these systems uh, and processes to be as automatic as possible, that we will be able to, to cope with that. But there's no, there's no point denying it's going to be a massive challenge. Okay, thanks very much. Sir. And just a final question, Ian. Um, why, have some, why have some been asked to make repayments while others haven't? Because there seems to be a slight, we're getting some reports that some have been asked to make repayments, but others haven't. Is that, again, down to the staffing issue? Or? Uh, no, um, it's, it's two slightly different classes of, of, of issues. Um, so uh, this is a, let's come on to the letter then that the, the Minister sent to you earlier in the, early in the week. Um, yep. So I can come on to that now if you want. Yep. Um, we have a, a, a group of... Um, a group of businesses who received the funding and they, they should not have received it. I think that's essentially um, the, the simplest way to explain it. Uh, the yeah, mistakes exactly. were made in approving um, some businesses for funding um, that shouldn't have been entitled to it. Mm -hmm. um, so in those cases, they are not entitled to the money at all. And we have to then recover that from them. Um, there are some other cases where the, the uh, a few quirks and anomalies in the regulations mean that um, they're entitled to fund for shorter periods of time than other businesses are, and so they may have been paid too much. So we have to recover the overpayment from, from those businesses. Um, then there's a, a different group of, of people, and they may have had um, more than one application submitted and both approved and potentially have received funding in respect of both, and we have uh, latterly have found that to be the case. What we've done in those cases is say, rather than try to get money back off people, um, what we'll do is we'll stop payments in relation to both those applications until the amount of money that the business is owed because of the passage of time has caught up with the amount of money that they've actually been paid. Um, and so most of those have been dealt with, I think, by the um, restrictions being extended to the 14th of April or, or today. Um, so most of those have been dealt with. Um, and then what we do from then on is one of the applications gets stopped completely and the payments continue um, until the restrictions end on the other. And then that way, at the end of the process, everybody has received the correct amount of money and there's no need to recover. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Yeah. Philip? <clears throat> Philip, you're a mute. Nope. Uh, you, you beat me to it again, Chair. I, was, I mean, I have a lot of constituents ringing me uh, asking about the time frame, and Ian has answered that. And then I was just looking clarification on the the letter that the minister has sent us. So you've asked that. So I will just take the opportunity uh, to again thank Ian and his staff. I mean, my office and I've been on to him since he was last with us a, a good few times in relation to applications on behalf of constituents. And I have to say that uh, Ian and his team have worked really, really well. And, 
nearly in the majority of the cases have worked out in favor of constituents with all of that work. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Okay. Chairman? Jim. Yeah, yeah, just to once again reiterate what Philip said there, um, again, it's been a very satisfactory couple of weeks uh, from my end in the relationship with LPS. I hope there's a few knighthoods awarded as a result of all this. <laughs> also, uh, I must say your internet connection is absolutely wonderful, so I'll have to find your provider because you're, you're coming over very, very clearly <laughs> from, uh, from, from your palatial mansion, wherever that is. Um, Holy palatial. <laughs> can, I, can, can, I, can I just ask you, um, you, you've obviously tried very hard to catch everybody, uh, mm -hmm. with a good degree of success, I'd have to say. You know, I think you know, one by one we're knocking down the people who've been excluded. Would it not be worth LPS considering a general one final catch-all miscellaneous fund for anybody left behind? Because you, you've, started, you've identified the soft play area issue, and that's great because they were in a dreadful position, because they're like the wet pubs, they hardly opened at all last year. You identified those with the 50,000 plus rateable valuation and you've caught them. There's still a very small core number of people who none of the arrangements actually meet their, their concerns. Are you working on a, a final scheme just to catch that last few? Um, no, we have no plans for any further schemes at the minute. Although, um, I suppose that will depend entirely on what the executive decides to do and whether they, they believe there's a requirement for, for additional schemes. Um, I, I would say that um, this is not actually uh, Department of Finance's core work, certainly not LPS's core work. Um, and um, we have kind of picked these things up because uh, emergency measures have been re required um, and been quite happy to do that. But essentially, I think the decisions about what is required to support businesses now um, in Northern Ireland really ought to properly sit with the Department of the Economy to come forward if they believe any further schemes are necessary. Um, there have been some discussions between the departments about how in the new financial year, we'll, we'll have a look at these um, issues and how things like the LRSS scheme uh, and some of the other ones that the FE run are, are kind of core supports for businesses um, and any additional schemes um, that will be introduced will be tailored around that core support. Um, and that's how um, gaps in provision would best be addressed, I think. But we'll just kind of pick your brains just on a, a case that's come up in South Down. A gentleman who's a printer but it's almost entire, his work is church related, it's funerals, it's uh, marriage mm. ceremonies, it's christenings. Obviously, as a result of the dramatic cut in the number of people who can attend, his business is just gone. But he's mm. still allowed to open as a printer. Uh, he can print, he's got a, a sort of printing mm. press, and he can work away. He can't obviously open up yeah. to customers, but he can continue to print. Do you see the third SL there as being a potential one for him? to try and obtain funding from? Um, but I think it depends on the size of his business. Um, and what he, he could have applied for might have been the uh, Part B of the um, DFE scheme, the Coronavirus <coughs> Restrictions Business Support Scheme. Uh, that was designed to support supply chain businesses who themselves aren't required to close, but whose business depends um, largely or entirely on businesses who are required to close or, or functions or activities that are required to shut. Um, if the business occupies uh, commercial premises and it has, uh, let's say it's a small premises um, and he received a £10,000 grant um, last year. He, he may well be entitled to the £5,000 additional payment um, this time from the new schemes. Um, if it's a very large premises uh, and it was an industrial style of premises, which printers sometimes are, then I think he might be entitled to the, um, the large scheme or if it's a medium-sized industrial, obviously as well he would be entitled to the, the £25,000 grant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And else? Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks very much indeed, Ian, and thanks very much indeed again for your very hard work. And uh, we look forward to, uh, no doubt we'll be talking again fairly soon. But thanks, everybody, yeah. and everybody okay. keep safe. Okay. Cheers. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Okay, team, we've got a few of these statutory rules to do. So we'll start it off with Statutory Rule 2021, Business Tenancies Restrictions on Forfeiture. Statutory Rule 2021 74, the Business Tenancies Coronavirus Restriction of Forfeiture Relevant Period Northern Ireland Regulations 2021, page 123. The Statutory Rule provides that a right of re entry or forfeiture under a relevant business tenancy for non payment of rent may not be enforced by action or otherwise until the 30th of June 2021. 
This is, was previously recommended by the Committee. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure of the Assembly and was led in the breach of the 21-day rule. The Committee agreed on 10 March 2021 that it was content for the proposed rule to be made. The Department advises that the policy content of the rule is unchanged from the SL1. I uh, could I ask Assembly Broadcasting to, make all, uh, to bring all the members in on spotlight, please? Okay. If the members are content that the Committee for Finance has considered the statutory rule SR 2021-74, the Business Tenancies Coronavirus Restrictions and Forfeiture Relevant Period Northern Ireland Regulations 2021, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules reports, have no objection to this rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Statutory rule 2021-86, Corona uh, COVID Industrial Business Support. Statutory rule, statutory rule 21-86. Financial Assistance Coronavirus Industrial Business Regulations Northern Ireland 2021, is at page 130. This rule will permit one off coronavirus support payments to businesses as follows 25,000 to industrial businesses and premises with a total NAV between 15 and 51,000, which were unable to access either the 10K small business grant or the 25,000 grant during 2021. The cost of the scheme for 1,100 medium-sized industrial, business, uh, industrial businesses is given as $27.9 million. The rule is subject to negative resolution assembly procedure, came into effect on 31 March 2021 and was led in breach of the 21-day rule. At its meeting on 24 March 2021, the Committee considered a related SL1. The Committee was content for the rule to be made. Following this, the Department took legal advice and then split the SL into three separate SRs. This is the first of three, those of these three SRs. The Department advises that the policy content of the SR does not differ from the SL1. If we are content that the Committee for Finance has considered the statutory rule 2021-86, the Financial Assistance Coronavirus Industrial Businesses Regulations Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to this rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, statutory Rule 2188, COVID Large Business Support. The statutory Rule 2021 the Financial Assistance Coronavirus Large Business Regulations Northern Ireland 2021, is at page 140. The rule will permit one off coronavirus support payments of 50k for 50,000 for certain businesses occupying premises with a net annual value of over 51,000, which were not able to access grant funding previously. Members, may wish to note that the regulation limit provisions in some regards, e.g. in respect of petrol stations and multiple occupancy. The cost of the scheme benefiting 1,125 businesses is given as $56.3 million. The rule is subject to negative resolution uh, assembly procedure, came into effect on 31 March 21, and is led in breach of the 21-day rule. At its meeting on 24 March 21, the Committee considered the related SL1, the committee was attempt, uh, content for the rule to be made. Following this, the department took the legal advice and then split the SL1 into three different SRs, as previously reported. This is the second of those SRs. The department advises that the policy content of the SR does not differ from the SL1. That the uh, members, if we are content, that the committee for finance has considered the statutory rule SR2188, the financial assistance coronavirus large business regulations Northern Ireland 2021 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules reports has no objection to this <coughs> rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. 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 Uh, 2187, statutory rule 2187, COVID small and business and other business support. Statutory rule 2187, financial assistance coronavirus business support regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, page 151. The rule will permit one-off coronavirus support repeat payments to businesses which received either the 10,000 small business grant or 25,000 hospi retail, hospitality, tourism and leisure granted 2020, but which have been unable to access the <coughs> Localised Restrictions Support Scheme, LRSS, or Coronavirus Restrictions Business Support Scheme, CRBSS Part B. The cost of the scheme for the 17,500 benefiting, benefiting business is given as $93.7 million. The rule is subject to negative resolution uh, assembly procedure, came into effect on the 31st of March 2021 and has led in breach of the 21-day rule. At its meeting on the 24th of March 21, the committee considered a related SL1. The committee was content for the rule to be made. Following this, the department took legal advice and, as previously stated, split the SL1 into three SRs. 
This is the third of those uh, SRs. The Department advises that the policy content of the SR does not differ from the SL1. Members, are we content Agreed. that the Committee for Finance has considered the statutory bill 2187, the Financial Assistance Coronavirus Business Support Regulations Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to this rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Statutory Rule 2194, Financial Assistance Amendment Regulations. The, statutory, uh, the relevant Statutory Rule 2194, the Financial Assistance Coronavirus No. 2, Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 21. The other papers is at page 161 to 177. The rule came into effect on the 9th of April 21 and is led in breach of the 21-day rule. It is subject to negative resolution assembly procedure. The Department advised that the rule is similar to other statutory rules considered by the Committee during Christmas 2020, in that it is to bring the Department of Finance legislation around pandemic support for businesses into alignment with changing Department of Health regulations. The current version of the latter are appended for information. The affected businesses are wide-ranging in nature, and further amending regulations will be required. If we are content, the, commit that the Committee for Finance has considered the Statutory Rule, st statutory rule 2021-94, the Financial Assistance Coronavirus No. 2 Amendment Regulation Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Is this agreed? Agreed. agreed. Moving on to Statutory Rule 2189, COVID assistance to soft play businesses. Statutory Rule 2189, the Financial Assistance Coronavirus Soft Play Business Regulations, Northern Ireland 21, is at page 206. The purpose of the rule is to provide for financial assistance to be awarded to soft play businesses restricted between the 4th of July 2020 and 14th of September 2020, and before the local restrict, localised restriction support scheme came into place in October 2020. The rule is subject to negative resolution assembly procedure and is led in breach of the 21-day rule. The committee considered the related SL1 in its meeting on the 24th of March. The department indicates that the led rule does not deviate from the original policy proposal. Are we content? Agreed. The committee for finance has considered the statutory rule 2189, financial assistance coronavirus soft play business regulations Northern Ireland 21, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to this rule. Are we so agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Moving on to the next item, different set of st uh, statutory rules. Statutory Rule 2021-90, COVID assistance to airports. Statutory Rule 2021-90, Financial Assistance Airports Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 21, is at page 217. The rule will increase support from 7.8 million to a maximum of 10 million, and is designed to cover 100% of the two Belfast airports' losses up to the 10 million pound cap. The money was allocated during January monitoring and the Department uh, previously advised of this. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure and is led in breach of the 21-day rule. The Committee considered the related SL1 at its meeting on the 24th of March 21 and agreed that it had no objection to the policy content. The Department indicates that the laid rule does not deviate from the policy set out in the SL1. Are we content? Um. That the Committee for Finance has considered the Statutory Rule 2190, Financial Assistant Airports Amendments Regulations, Northern Ireland 21, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to this rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Pensions, uh, Statutory Rule 2192, Pensions Increase Order and uh, GMP Indexation Direction. GMP? Uh, guaranteed Minimum Pension. Guaranteed Minimum Pension. Uh, Statute Drill 2192, the Pensions Increase Review Order in Northern Ireland 21 is at page 225. The rule increases public services pensions and payment before the 6th of April 2020 by 0.5% in line with the Consumer Price Index from the 12th of April 21. HM Treasury makes a similar order to provide for equivalent pensions increase in Great Britain. The committee noted the SL1 in its meeting on the 10th of February 21. The Department advises that the lead rule does not deviate from the policy set out in the SL1. The Department advises that the rule is not subject to any further assembly procedure. Is the Committee content to note? Note. Agreed. Correspondence from the Department is included on page 233 relating to the indexation of guaranteed minimum pension GMP. Officials will provide a short related oral briefing. Uh, can we bring it? Have we still got it? Lannard Stephen. Yeah. Lannard Stephen. Can you come in, please? 
Uh, hi, Blanet. Hi, Stephen. Uh, sorry for apologies for running late. Um, would you like to uh, give us any statement on the GMP index? In, in, sorry, I shall try and say that again. The GMP indexation uh, direction, please. Thank you very much. Today. I think you're muted. Hello. Yeah, thanks. Can you hear well, me now? We've got you, Blanet. No, thanks. Okay, um, just to give you an overview then um, on the GMP and the purpose of the direction. GMP is the minimum level of pension public service schemes must provide for scheme members for their service between the 6th of April 1978 and the 5th of April 1997. Uh, GMP arose as a condition of the scheme being contracted out of the additional earnings related state pension during that period. And as a consequence of contracting out, members and employers paid a lesser amount of uh, national insurance contributions during that time. Since the introduction of the new single tier state pension on the 6th of April 16, public service pension schemes have had the responsibility for applying the full annual cost of living indexation of the GMP entitlements for their scheme members who reach state pension age on or after that date in April 16. Previously, these increases were part paid in conjunction with the now defunct additional state pension, which existed before the introduction of the new single tier state pension. Any accrual of DMP uh, ceased in 1997. Uh, following a recent consultation, Treasury announced the method for full annual indexation by the schemes, which has been in place since April 16, is the most practical approach to fulfil the previous commitments for full indexation until the remaining GMPs eventually work their way out of the system. The legislation and process governing the treatment of GMPs here is identical to that operated in Great Britain. Full scheme indexation in devolved schemes is currently provided for by direction of the Department of Finance under Article 69A of the Social Security Pensions, Northern Ireland Order 1975. A comparable direction is operated under equivalent legislation by ATM Treasury for schemes in Great Britain. The parent legislation is listed in Section 87 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 as legislation under which parity of provision on social security benefits and pensions may apply. The Department of Finance direction made on the 2nd of April 2021 ensures that public service pensioners in devolved schemes who reach state pension age on or after the 6th of April 2021 will continue to have their GMP entitlements <coughs> fully operated by their scheme as appropriate and are not disadvantaged. So that's that. Okay, thanks very much, Evelyn. Jim? Um, uh, again, I'm Chair of the Assembly Pension Trustees uh, and have been a member of the Trustees for 17 years. Um, so once again, you're telling us we, we have no discretion at all in this. Uh, we, we simply have to follow what's happening in the rest of the United Kingdom. So even if we, That's so even if we want, so really, to be honest, our whole debate about <laughs> McLeod was a wee bit academic because at the end of the day, the principles in concrete that we simply have to follow the rest of the UK and all pension provision. Uh, no, public service pensions policy is devolved on matters, but because this is related to the state, state pension um, and because it comes under that social security order, it's, uh, and it's listed then under the 1998 Act, um, we wouldn't do anything different in that regard. So we're simply rubber stamping a decision that's already been taken in GB, if, if truth be known. Um, Yes, but the devolved schemes were involved. We had representation in uh, a GMP working group since 2015. Um, so they have been involved in the policy development and looking at the options for this ind indexation going forward. Um, one of the options was you know, to convert this GMP and a scheme benefit. Um, but the outcome of the consultation, um, which um, would have covered the Northern Ireland schemes for indexation to continue. And how many pensioners do we know are affected by this? Obviously, it's a small number, relatively small number, 
because obviously anyone who's joined any scheme more recently won't be won't be included in this. So no. how, how do we know how many civil service pensioners are, are, are affected by this? For civil service, we don't have a breakdown by scheme or even for Northern Ireland. Um, there were some uh, calculations done by Treasury um, where I think prior to 2016, there were 2 million and there would be 1 million then going forward. Um, this is like a UK wide figure. Yeah. Um, so approximate number with DMP who will reach state pension age on or after April 2024, but before April 30 would be around a million and then another million who would reach state pension age on or after April 2030. But in line of, you know, the numbers for public service pensions on a UK wide basis, yeah, those numbers are smallish. And nobody will have accrued any DMP from 1997. So it will eventually work its way out of the system. Yeah. And you also said indexation. Is that RPI or CPI? On what basis? Um, the indexation would be CPI. CPI, even though it's, it's retrospective, it's still CPI. The government moved from RPI to CPI after In 2011, that. yeah. So, but we're retrospectively yeah. going back to apply CPI to these pensioners, even though they would have anticipated RPI. Uh, it's applied for all accrued pensions. CPI is the rate applied to accrued pensions, no matter when they were accrued by. Even though that's a retrospective application of that less attractive index? Yeah. Now, RPI always runs significantly ahead of CPI. Uh, yes, that would be the experience to date. Well, it always has been the, to date, you know, because yeah. RPI takes in housing costs uh, and CPI doesn't. So, so therefore, could, could these pensioners feel a wee bit aggrieved that, that at the time uh, this was happening, RPI applied, but in retrospect, you're applying CPI? Yeah, but the same would apply to anybody who has accrued pension um, prior to 2011 when the government changed uh, the indexation to CPI. Any pension accrued before that would be revalued um, by CPI. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much indeed, Bernard. Um, so, as the GMP indexation direction is made under Article 69A of the Social Security Pensions Northern Ireland Order, 1975, there is no associated assembly procedure. Are members therefore to content to note this direction? Content? Are yes. we agreed? Great. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, now we move on to uh, correspondence, and we do have quite a lot of correspondence to go through, and actually most of it is quite important, so uh, please, with your indulgence. Uh, members are asked to note the index of 33 received items of correspondence at page 244. First item, uh, Department of Finance, Property Management Companies. Members are asked to note the Department's response on page 250 to the Committee for Communities regarding shared property management companies. Uh, Department of Finance indicates that it is working on the development of a registration system and a code of conduct. Legislation may follow next year according to uh, uh, questions. Are members content to note? Great. Okay. Next item is Department of Finance, Building Fire Safety Designated Department. Members are asked to defer consideration of a response at page 251 regarding Building Fire Safety Programme. The Department provides information on the GB programme but did not answer the Committee's queries regarding the Northern Ireland programme. The Department has recently written again providing, uh, the Department has recently written again providing further cl clarification. Just so you are aware, the Northern Ireland Civil Service Board was recently asked to consider the gap in current policy responsibility raised by the cross-departmental group set up to consider the implications in Northern Ireland for fire safety measures. The Board could not agree policy responsibility for the new building safety measures. This highlights a potential need for a realignment and extension of departmental responsibilities. And bearing in mind, we have heard the discussions about uh, both uh, environmental regulations on buildings and a whole variety of building regulations as well that has come through. Uh, the Department advises that while the programme is focused on fire safety in residential properties and houses of multiple application, it also takes into consideration fire safety in all buildings across the devolved administrations. 
The executive has agreed that the head of civil service chairs across departmental group to consider the coverage of the MHLCG building safety program and determine departmental policy responsibilities and content in a similar program here. The original ministerial correspondence has indicated that the above was urgent. This does not really appear to be the case as we see it at the moment. Are we content to consider all the related correspondence at next week's meeting? Because I think this is important. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. EU Affairs Office, House of Lords and EU Proposals. The members are asked to note on page 325 copies of correspondence from the House of Lords Europe, European Union Committee to Westminster Department's EU issues. Uh, members content to note. Are we agreed? Uh, the Northern, Af Northern Ireland Office New Deal for Northern Ireland. Members are asked to note a response page 261 from the NIO regarding the 400 million New Deal for Northern Ireland package announced by the Secretary of State on the 10th of December 2020. Nearly half of the 400 million has now been allocated, most of which went to programme lead by Westminster Departments and was related to the movement of agri-food products and medicine supply chains between GB and Northern Ireland. Do members wish to make any comment? Okay. Happy to note. Agreed. Department of Finance scheme of registrable interest. Members were asked to note at page 264 that under the functioning of Government Miscellaneous Provisions Act Northern Ireland 21, the Minister has led a scheme defining the categories of financial and other interests that are registrable by ministers and special advisers. Are we content to note? No. Agreed. Okay. Department for Finance Digital Transformation and Land Web Project. Members are asked to note the Department's response at page 268 to the PAC report on the Land Web Project. The Department is to undertake a cultural audit of a culture audit by October 21, issue a Dear Accounting Officer letter regarding contract management, review the extent of contract management expertise in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, revise guidance on contract extensions, and bring forward a revised land registry fees order pending completion of the Ulster University study. The Department has also developed a formal knowledge transfer process for the whole of NICS to support succession planning. There seems to be quite a lot in that um, response. And uh, I, I do, for some of us, I do understand what a Dear Accounting Officer letter means. But when they say they want to review the extent of contract management expertise in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, I think there's something quite fundamental there. And when it says we want to take, uh, undertake a culture audit, I think we probably wouldn't, would like to have a bit more um, uh, sort of evidence and a bit more discussion about that between ourselves and the department, because there seems to be quite a lot in that that I think um, I think is we should be uh, at least taking an overview of and being able to uh, ask suitable questions on that issue. So since PAC has now just about concluded its work on this, and they're due, and I think I think they just have. Are about to. So, in that case, are we agreed? Great. Uh, Committee for the Economy, Fiscal Council, and Fiscal Commission. Members are noted page 227 to 279 correspondence between the Committee for the Economy and the Department for Finance regarding the establishment of the Fiscal Council and Fiscal Commission. Are we content to note? Good. Agreed. Okay. Department for Finance, Nisra, Quarterly Sickness, Abness, and Absence in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, 2020, December 2020. Members are asked to note page 281 from the Department a copy of the NISA report regarding sickness and absence. Absence in the Northern Ireland Civil Service is increasing, but is still lower than pre-pandemic le levels. Much of the increase since the previous quarter relates to male employees at AO level, aged between 35 and 44, in respect of respiratory complaints and stress and anxiety. Are members content to note? No. Great. Great. Shields are us, Northern Ireland, number of working age uh, uh, clinical, uh, clinically extremely vulnerable. Response regarding that is on page 299. Members, are we content to note? Brilliant. Agreed. The Department of Health wrote a reference clinically extremely vulnerable groups. Members are asked to note at page 301 response from the Minister of Health regarding potential return for work for those of the CV category. The Minister advised that at least one half of all CV people had been vaccinated. But regardless of their vaccination status, revised guidance is to apply to this group from the 12th of April 2021. Are we content to note? Agreed. A Minister of Finance 2021 Public Expenditure Allocation. Members are asked to note at page 305 a copy of the statement made by the Minister of Finance regarding 2021 Public Expenditure Allocation. The Minister advises that all available resource Dell has now been allocated 
but he appears to indicate the financial transaction capital will be lost. Indeed, when the sort of as um, uh, the clerk very ably noted, the, the, the accompanying tables also refer to a, a shortfall in the Northern Ireland water pension shortfall of 16 million, and the fact that the Belfast Harbour commissioners are looking to seek, uh, seek to increase their borrowing to 10 million. Um, I think it's worthy of us having a uh, individually having a look at that and see if there's any further detail of that. But at this stage, I'm content to note. Are you content to note? Yes. Great. Department of Finance Spring Supplementary Estimates Headroom uh, Reconciliation. Members are asked to note at page 314 the Department makes some corrections and clarifications that $599 million of resources was allocated in the last weeks of 2021, along with $27.8 million of capital, versus what had been briefed as a headroom of $1 billion. So there is a delta there of about 40%. Are we content to note? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Department of Finance minute on the direction of accruing resources, spring supplementary estimates. Members are asked to note at page 320 a departmental minute setting out the accruing resources for 2021, covering resources other than that specified in the Budget Act, i.e. pension contributions, and permitting their use by their, those departments. The sums involved for some departments are very significant. And a very lengthy summary with limited uh, spe specificity is provided. Um, members, are we content to write to the Department and ask for a proper breakdown of the accruing resources where, there it's, where at least the granularity is at least uh, over a million? Because it does seem to be, um, I, I don't seem to have a lot of detail on that, and I think we should be, we should be looking at this quite closely. And I think we should be doing it. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, the order of the next three correspondence items differs from them. Oh, sorry, I shall do that one. Uh, next one up is Minister of Finance update in the 21-22 final budget. Members are asked to note correspondence at page 335 in respect of the budget for 21-22. These have all been circulated to members. The committee has asked other statutory committees to take evidence on related matters before the end of April in order to inform uh, scrutiny of the anticipated budget number two bill 2021. The correspondence indicates that, as confirmation of certain allocations have not been provided by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, these are not included in the budget, but are expected to be funded through monitoring rounds. Thus, there is no reference to the Victims' Pension Scheme. Are you content to note? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, the Executive Office uh, funding Victims' Pension. Members are asked to note TO correspondence on page 330. This is a response to the committee, qu committee queries regarding the Victims' Pension Scheme, Troubles Permanent Disabled Scheme. The TEO clarifies that the payments to recipients may be £16 million in 2021, with 6.7 of admin costs. Members are asked to note in tabled items a copy of the relevant uh, government accounting or uh, go GA government, uh, government actuaries department. Go government actuaries department report. Are the members content to write to the Department again to seek clarity on how the Victims' Pension Scheme is to be funded from the 2021 budget? Because I, at the moment, I can't really see where the lines are for that. So I think we should be getting a briefing on the Department how we do that. Are we agreed? Yep. Agreed. Uh, sorry, Chair. Just to agree, it's my fault. The, the payment is going to be 19 million, not 16 million. Yeah, that's what I thought. Nine, 19 million. Yeah. Plus the sorry, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next item, Justice Committee Troubles Permanent Dis Disabled and Pension Scheme. Members are asked to note the Committee for Justice correspondent at page 334 requesting a copy of the Government Actuary Department's report on estimated costs and the Victims' Pension Scheme once received. Are we content to forward the Government Actuaries Department's report to the Committee for Justice for its information? Great. Great. Uh, Department for Finance, Presbyterian Mutual Society. Uh, members are asked to consider page 351. I know we have been at this quite a lot of this committee today, and this committee has been quite long, but I think this is an important thing. We, we look at this quite closely. Response from the Department regarding the Presbyterian Mutual Society and a copy of the recent press coverage. The Department explains that the PMS Savers agreed a rescue package backed by a £225 million loan from RRI. There is an 18.5 million projected deficit on the DFE's loan associated with the liquidation of the remaining assets. This was paid in January monitoring, as DFE has first priority in realisation. 
Consequently, no other PMS savers are likely to receive any further pay payments. Do members have any comments? Yes, yes, yes I'm, glad, I'm glad this has come up. Uh, this has clarified the situation. It was my understanding that most savers got a very substantial first payment way back maybe 12 years ago. And I, I thought that just what was then happening was bit by bit everyone was getting their money back. Yeah. I was a bit shocked to, to find about this, this deficit, which means that uh, basically some folk have got around 77%. Um, and the reason the gentleman from Mid Ulster wrote to us that he was caught up in this and he wasn't going to get the rest. The problem was the Presbyterian Mutual Society opted not to go into the investor compensation scheme, mm. which would have been paid through a small levy on their assets, as all banks and building societies uh, and, and friendly societies do. So, therefore, the government came in way, way back. This was 2007. Uh, the Assembly decided to come in and borrow the £200 million. And I, I thought this was all put to bed. Mm -hmm. The Department have obviously decided to seize upon this uh, this uh, £18 million shortfall and just said, thank you very much, and left the savers' hand dry. When were, you to when were you ever told this was going to happen? Yeah, and had the gentleman not rat written to us, would we have ever known? Yeah, I don't think we would. So, I, I'm just, I, I mean, this came as a bolt from the blue. As well, I think I'm the only member of the committee as a survivor from that period. And uh, there was really two sets of verb borrowers. There's private individuals, and you had to be Presbyterian in order to join it. So, thank heavens I'm not. <laughs> um, but I, I also Presbyterian churches uh, had substantial investments in it for new church halls, etc., church refurbishments. Um, the thing has gone absolutely quiet for 10 years, and suddenly we now find this. Uh, is there any way we can get a bit more briefing on, on what's been going on behind the scenes here about, about this whole issue? Because we all believe this had been sewn up, put to bed and forgotten about, and now we find that that isn't the case. And why did the department, why were they so quick to take the 18 million? Um, could they not have s sat on it just to see how things develop? Because it's funny enough that property markets not, is doing very well at the moment. And there was a hope that the assets of the Presbyterian Mutual Society, eventually, they would get repayment of it all because a significant proportion of it was agricultural land, which has stayed very firm throughout all of this. So I'd like a wee bit more in terms of a briefing from the department as to how this has got to the stage we're at today. Certainly right to the department, I think, and also I would suggest copy to the Committee for the Economy. Economy. Um, I suspect they, this may sit with the Department for the Economy, but we can still uh, ask the question. If you look at page um, 351 onwards, there is um, some further information. Oh, for goodness sake, if we can get this to work. There is a, uh, I don't want to say a liquidator, but there was a, an organisation who were looking after the loan. I got the impression at page 353 that they decided, that given where the assets were, they had the, that was the the option that they would have to go with, and that DFE had first priority. Yes, it got paid, and the rest did not. So I think that that was that was the reasoning. But absolutely, chair. Um, yes, but what I, would have the, but it would have been in the discretion of DFE just to say, we'll not take it and let it be distributed amongst the PMS members. Yeah, I mean, I, there's there's quite a few <laughs> there's quite a few unanswered questions about this, about you know how it is rematerialised. What is the issues to do it? I you know I would I would like a more detailed briefing from the department, yeah. and indeed if it has to come from there and also from the Department of Economy, I would like to sort of circulate this correspondence uh, to the Committee for the Economy as well, so they're they're aware of this. But I would like to have some more information because it does seem strange that after so many years when this had been sort of supposedly um, sorted, it's, it's come back. Do we still have the contact details of the gentleman who raised it with the committee? Sure we do, yes. We were just letting him have a little update as that we're still looking into it. Uh, yes, Chair, but also, um, as the members are aware, the, the letter, which is at page 353, is the letter that was sent to, to members of, of PMS. So, uh, but yes, I will I'm certainly yeah. advise that the no, committee is the Yes, I understand that, anything. but he may not be known that we have actually taken this on board and are uh, still yeah, pursuing still. it. Indeed. <coughs> yes, Chair. Okay, thank you. Are yeah. we content? Yeah, yeah I agree. Can I just add a check, Chair, on the, 
on the letter, I think it would be helpful for us to specifically ask for a an update on the number of savers who have lost out. Because clearly, part of the challenge here is this information has been really poorly communicated to the assembly, for not least, and there's no clear sense of. Um, how many savers have lost out here? Because it's, as yep. Jim said, so some people have got most of their savings back, others have. Well, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, with what Jim said, I was thought at the time when that all happened, uh, I'm sure we're all the same. We thought that this was brought in in order to completely settle that, that was outstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, is so that what, correct? You know, I thought, yes. what it looks as if it says that whatever the assets were liquidated, yeah. sort of it went to the biggest creditor, and the biggest creditor was deemed to be the Department of the Economy. So rather than go into the um, rather than to go into the uh, sort of the recipients right. of the sort of the pension and the rest of it, I went to the Department of Economy. So it's just trying to understand the sort of how that process went, and again, sort of bearing in mind that it's it, and as I think as Jim Wells quite rightly points out, it's just come out. It just seemed to come out of the blue, mm. and that's that's the unusual thing. But somewhere, somewhere or another, it must have been on somebody's risk register, or somebody it, would have been aware of it. To be fair, to the, department, the one thing we did notice each year in the estimates was a certain amount coming in each year as recruitment yes. from the Presbyterian Mutual Society. But I just assumed if you added it all up, it came to 200 million and everyone's happy. But it's obviously, that's not the case. Yeah. It was 19 million in the estimates this year, or last year, came in. So it looked like it was steadily unwinding. Yeah. Uh, well, so my other thought is I think the church has got almost every penny back. It's the small people that are sitting on the 77% return. Yeah. Content? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Moving on to the next item of correspondence Department of Finance, single farm payments, historic liabilities. Members are asked to consider page 364 a response regarding the single farm payments, historical liabilities, and further correspondence from Jim Shannon, page uh, MP at page 366. Uh, DERA refers to 114 cases where the independent panel's findings were not accepted, and a total liability to the Northern Ireland Block grant of 2.4 million. Are members content to forward the departmental response to uh, uh, the Right Honourable Jim Shannon, MP? Who raised the issue with the committee? Are we agreed? agreed. I'm relieved if it, that's the sort of figure we're talking about. It's not too bad. Yeah, it's 2.4. I mean, when I looked at it, I thought it would be substantially more, but okay. But it's still an awful lot of money. Uh, moving on to next item of correspondence: briefing the committee on proposals for Peace Plus program. Members asked to note at page 370 correspondence for SEUPB confirming the briefing schedule for the 26th of May 2020 on the Peace Plus consultation. Are members content to note? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, move the Department for Finance Public Procurement Common Framework. Members are asked to defer consideration of the Public Procurement Common Framework on page 409, which was provisionally agreed by the JMCEN on the 4th of March 21. Members previously noted this at the meeting of the 24th of March 21. Further correspondence from the Minister of Finance has been obtained. Are members content to consider all of the related correspondence at next week's meeting? Is this agreed? Agreed. Great. Department for Finance, Northern Ireland Procurement Board update. Members asked to note at page 395 a response from the department indicating that there has been no adverse commentary on the rollout of the open data contracting standard. The department confirms that the Dunlop review made no reference to procurement or the role of the remit of the department. Are we content to note? Note. note and agreed. Department of Finance, ABBA Driving School COVID support. Members are asked to consider a response at page 339 from the Department regarding the LRSS support for driving schools and indicated that it had revisited its decision following revised advice from the Department of Health. At page 405, members are asked to note correspondence from the ABBA Driving School confirming anticipated receipt of support from LRSS and thanking the committee for its work in this regard. Are members content to note and forward the Department of Finance's response to the ABBA Driving School for information? Are we agreed? Great. Minister for the Economy, COVID-19 Business Support Schemes. Members are asked to note at page 406 a ministerial response to the committee regarding COVID-19 business support schemes, including details of £500 million pounds of schemes developed and delivered by the Department of the Economy. Are members content to share this response with the Committee for the Economy and to write to the Department for the Economy seeking an explanation as to why the limited company directors and large tourism and hospitality business support schemes have not made any payment. Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay. Department of Finance NICS Apprenticeship Scheme. Members are asked to note at page 418 a copy of correspondence from the Department of Finance to the Committee for the Economy regarding the NICS Apprenticeship Scheme. Are we content to note? Agreed. Okay. 
Welsh Parliament Finance Committee Fifth Senate uh, Legacy Report. Members are asked to note correspondence regarding the Finance Committee Fifth Senate Legacy Report, page 434. The report recommends close working with devolved administrations in the next mandate in respect to budgetary matters. I think we can agree on that. Are we agreed? Agreed. Yes. agreed. Uh, the ISNI report, March 21. Members are asked to note the ISNI report for March 21 at page 436, taking out capital investment by the Department. Are we content to note? Agreed. Great. Committee for Health, call for evidence, health and social care bill. Members are asked to note at page 439 from the Committee for Health for a call for evidence for health and social care bill, which is to abolish the regional health and social care boards. It is understood the Department of Finance is to bring forward an arm's length body bill which will include provisions to abolish other arm's length bodies. Are we content to note? Mm -hmm. No. Agreed. Justice Committee call for evidence damage return on investment bill. Members are uh, asked to note on page 441 from the Justice Committee a call for evidence for the damages return on investment bill. Are we content to note? No. Uh, since the Deputy Chair is not here, uh, we will uh, defer item 18.33. If we move on to item 18.34, uh, Member of Public Public Order Issues, ma sorry, mail order issues, before you slip there. <laughs> Apologies for that, people. There. Members are asked to note at page 447 correspondence from a member of the public regarding issues with the mail order company. The clerk is responding, advising the member of the public to contact the Consumer Council or their local MLAs. Are we content to note? Yeah. Right. Uh, composite request. Members are asked to consider the composite request at page 449. The committee is content that the composite request is an accurate and complete record of the committee's information requests. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Move on uh, to the forward work programme. The draft forward, forward work programme is page 461. In May and June, there are a number of oral evidence sessions relating to the Fiscal Council and Fiscal Commission from the OECD, IFS, Scottish Fiscal Commission, NICFA and Queen's University and the Oireachtas Parliamentary Budget Office. Briefings are also being sought from OBR and the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council. Briefings are also scheduled in respect of rates reform, budget number two bill, and from external experts on the Northern Ireland Protocol. It is expected that the committee will consider an LCM on the McLeod pensions uh, issue before the summer. Members, do we have any comments apart from the fact that it's going to be a busy and tight schedule? I have a, a mage here. Something to add to our burden. It's just a thought for us to consider. The kind of gold standard for some people in terms of budgetary, fiscal things is not on these islands. We sometimes in Northern Ireland we're constantly looking south and east. How are we doing compared to Britain? How are we doing compared to the, to the Republic? Actually, it's the Congressional Budget Office. I don't know if there's someone who would be willing to come and give us evidence either from the Congressional Budget Office or who knows about the working of the Congressional Budget Office. It's something to. Uh, I just think it's an. It would be an interesting piece of evidence for us to take. We would not be expecting them to, to get into the weeds of the Northern Ireland fiscal position or how you know, the devolved, our devolved settlement works, but it just might be an interesting bit of evidence to take, possibly with others. If, with your indulgence, Committee, maybe through the clerk and I, we'll approach the Consul General, because there are various outreaches that State do with various parts yeah. of um, the for Congress I think that would and be various things. Exactly it, might, it might be useful and it would be an interesting question to ask. I think it's a bit, but specifically, I think not for someone from the not a you know a, a, like a, a, a member of a party or a committee. It's the Congressional Budget Office because yeah. so because U.S. politics is super it's almost partisan as politics here. Um, but the CBO is yeah, the real goal. The CBO came long before the, the the Fiscal Advisory Council in the Republic or the or the OBR in the in GB. Okay. Yeah. The, we'll congress, the Congressional Budget Office. If you're content, we'll take that for action. Great. It is now less than a year until the end of the mandate. It is expected that the committee will consider the committee stages of at least four executive bills and possibly one private member's bill, all of which must be concluded in the autumn winter of 2021-22. This will require additional meetings. It may lead to quorum difficulties owing to legislative pressure from members of others' committees and leave little time for other work. So just that's a heads up, so that's the sort of level of work we're going to have in the autumn. Clark has spoken informally with a representative on UK finance regarding a more formal engagement by the committee in respect of banking matters. UK finance has shared previous related correspondence with the committee for the economy, which will be at next week's meeting pack. 
Are members content to share with, the, share with UK Finance the Department's recent correspondings relating to its role in respect of the banking sector and as lead liaison with the HM Treasury? Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Are members content with the forward work programme as amended? Agreed. agreed. Is there any other business? Sure. In light of the amount of work that we have coming in, I ask the rest of the members, myself included, to think of their questions. You let me make them short and quick to the point. Some of these questions uh, can go on for quite a bit. And time's running on, and if we want to get through this work, then we need to be thinking of other people's times as well as we ask the questions. I hope they understand me putting that forward and out there. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. You'll be aware that, um, particularly in the Finance Committee, it's sometimes in the rather extended questions we do get to some of the detail. And uh, one of the issues with finance, generally speaking, is that it's probably a more drier subject, but there are much more details in it as well. And it's always been my role, and as I see my role as a chair, is give people as much lati latitude as possible. Because uh, I must admit that in a lot of these issues, Whereas you know, many of us have a, a degree of understanding of some of the issues, and I, I particularly in areas of building regulations and things like that, I, I feel I need to be, I do have to ask some more probing questions. But your point is well taken, and thank you very much indeed, Pat. Okay, and if we are content, the date and plan of the next meeting is next uh, next Wednesday here at uh, 1400. Are we content? Thanks everybody. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. It's Stay at home, and if you're already at home. Uh, safe making the tea. Thank you very much today. Thank you. Thanks, members. Well done, Thank you. Cheers.